Hello everyone and welcome to part 3 of our King of Fires retrospective. Now, in case you missed the previous parts, then a card for it should be popping up right now, but if you need a quick refresher, King of Fires was a fighting game originally intended to be a crossover series between various SNK characters, but it quickly took on its own identity as it became an annual release with a continuous storyline that built from one installment to another. But during production of the last storyline, SNK, suffering from financial problems for many years, was bought up by the pachinko company Aruzi, who, surprise surprise, wanted to turn all their games into pachinko machines. They then let the company go bankrupt and sold all their franchises off for scrap. However, SNK's founder, Aikichi Kawasaki, split off to form multiple other companies where he not only purchased back all of SNK's franchises, but also hired back many of their former staff members. And so, with all their staff and all their franchises back under one roof, they christened this new company SNK Playmore, and they were all set to bring about the rebirth of SNK. Which ultimately led to the company's death once again. Oh yeah, we have a whole other set of problems to cover on today's episode, so let's go ahead and roll that intro and get into it, shall we? Began in 94, and found rolling in 95. He swore place in 96, and came to the hand in 97. Now it comes, and here we go. AOF is here again. I think some sound is 1 k had now found itself under a new home and were once again their own bosses. This was a bold new era for the company, an era of opportunity and endless possibilities, the SNK Playmore era. However, as uplifting as that might sound, the SNK Playmore era was actually a very divisive era. It's not so much that SNK did anything wrong during this time. Okay, there is something they did wrong during this time, and we'll get to that way later in the episode, but for the most part, there were just a lot of decisions that they made that left audiences vocally split. But before we start to get into that, let's start with the development of King of Fires 2003. Yes, the Nest Saga was over, which meant that a brand new King of Fires storyline was about to begin. And unlike the Nest Saga, where the development of that game and all the new characters had a crazy backstory behind it that all revolved around a cancelled game, the development of this new story was actually pretty simple. SNK knew exactly what they wanted from the start. They wanted something different. They wanted their new hero to be one that would stand out from the previous protagonist. So, while Kyo was your typical shonen style young adventurous hero, and K Dash was an aggressive action hero, they decided this new hero, Ash Crimson, need to be more feminine and fashionable. So, they gave them a big coiffed hairstyle and an outfit that looked more at home on the runway than in a battle, and they would have an attitude that was far more refined and elegant. However, the biggest change SNK had in mind for their new hero was that they wouldn't be a hero. Don't get me wrong, they were still referred to as the hero, simply because that's what SNK always calls the KOF protagonist. Every KOF storyline needs a hero, and it needs a rival. But they decided they wanted the hero of this new storyline to actually be a villain, with the SNK website at the time saying that the initial premise behind Ash Crimson was to make, quote, an attractive evil character. This was indeed a huge shift away from the previous stars, and it was an even bigger gamble. I mean, just think about it. SNK had collapsed, gone bankrupt, and been sold off piece by piece. But thanks to hard work and no small amount of money, the company was able to come back together. After going through something like that, most people would want to play it safe. But nope, SNK decided to turn the wheel in a brand new direction and step on the gas hard. This was a huge risk. And did it pay off? Well, remember how I said the SNK Playmore era was a divisive era? Ash Crimson is pretty much the poster boy for that. Because Ash has his fans, and he has his critics. And those two sides do not get along. Ash fans hold on to him dearly and cherish him as their special evil cinnamon roll, and Ash's critics will jump through your window to explain to you in detail all the things they don't like about him. 
In fact, I'd be willing to say that Ash Crimson is the most controversial character in KOF history, and when you are aware of all the characters in KOF history, that is indeed saying something. But why is that exactly? Well, I've already laid out a few of the reasons for you. There was the large change in tone and style of Ash compared to the previous heroes, and it was a huge gamble to make your new hero a villain, and I'll be honest with you, I actually really like that idea. I think that's a bold choice, and there's so many cool things that you could do making your newest hero a villain. But again, it's an idea that's bound to put people off. SNK artist Falcoon said that the idea behind Ash was to make a hero that players would, quote, feel bad for cheering on, which expanded beyond just being a villain. In addition to being a bad guy, Ash came off as pompous and egotistical. He regularly mocked the other characters and enjoyed teasing them. And again, kudos to them on trying something so bold, but if you make a character people are going to feel bad about cheering on, guess what? Some people are going to feel bad about them. Not everyone is going to step back and say, oh, I see what you're going for here. Yes, very intriguing. I want to see where this goes. No, a lot of people are going to look at them and say, wow, this guy is kind of an a-hole and I don't like him. But as I said, Ash was divisive. Some people hated this stuff about him, but other people really dug it. And speaking personally, I do have my own opinion on Ash, but I'm going to save that for the end of the episode, because there's actually far more to the Ash Crimson debate than what we've already said. There are many more arguments that people have for and against him that will play out as the series goes on. For now though, we had our heroes, so that means it was time to actually start building this new King of Fighters. And as I said, this was a new era for SNK. They felt refreshed after coming back from the brink of death. They were energized. So they decided now was the time for their company to explode. And if you were a Japanese video game company in the early 2000s and you wanted to explode, it could only mean one thing. Say it with me, folks. Appeal to the West. Oh, no. Okay, if you've watched our retrospectives before, then there's a good chance that you've heard me bring up that at this point in time, many Japanese gaming companies were trying to aim their games at American audiences. And for a good reason. In 2003, the video game industry was bringing in $15 billion a year, and 60% of that was all coming from North America. Yeah, the video game landscape was changing. Heck, we even brought that up in part two when we talked about SNK's financial problems, and we said that part of the reason why SNK was suffering at the time is because the one place on the planet where they could never catch on was in America. And now suddenly, America was where all the money was at. However, typically when I say things like gaming companies were trying to appeal to the West, the first thing that comes to your mind is stuff like this, and this, and this, and damn, even when I'm not doing a retrospective on a Capcom game, I still have to drag them a little, don't I? I think I have a problem. Point is, it was around this time that we were seeing a lot of Japanese studios making games load with things that they thought Western audiences wanted, without ever asking Western audiences if that's something that they actually wanted. Bleak gray settings, lots of swearing and crude humor, and of course, cover-based shooters as far as the eye could see. But SNK had a different approach. Their idea of how to make their games sell in the West was simply to try and sell their games in the West. Hold on, crazy idea, I know, but hear me out. Yes, in part two, you might remember me mentioning that Aruzi, after purchasing SNK, was trying to dismantle the company, purposely setting them up to fail. So much so that they even shut down SNK's US offices, because when video game sales are rising in America, of course you would want to shut down the branch of your company responsible for bringing your games to America. But now that SNK Playmore had been formed, they opened up brand new global branches with a focus on bringing these games to not just other countries, but to brand new consoles. As I mentioned previously, the arcade scene where SNK had lived and thrived was drying up at this time. The home console scene is where it was at in the early 2000s. Well, SNK knew this and they were setting their sights on this new audience. In 2003, Ben Herman, the president of SNK's USA branch, said that, quote, SNK Playmore will continue to develop new games for the PS2 and Xbox, as well as mentioning that they were going to begin development on games for the PSP and the next generation of all three consoles. This might seem like a big no-duh statement for a lot of companies, but again, SNK up to this point had largely been focused on arcades, 
So saying that they were going to begin focusing on these home consoles, especially the Xbox, a system that mostly saw success in the West, was a big statement. There may have also been another reason why he made those statements, but uh, you know what? I'm going to hold off on that. We'll get back to this statement later. Just, just keep it in your mind. Just remember that he said this. So yes, SNK was definitely changing up their strategy at this time, and speaking personally, this American push was very apparent to me at the time. I know I'm talking about KOF like I've been with them this entire time, but honestly, no, I was late to the SNK train. When I was a kid, I did play Fatal Fury at the arcades, but then I took a long break from the company until I was in college and I checked out Capcom vs SNK 2. That was really my big introduction to King of Fighters and the rest of the SNK world. And that was happening around the mid-2000s. And I bring this up because after playing Capcom vs SNK 2 and falling in love with it, I went to the game store one weekend and suddenly for the first time in my life I actually saw King of Fighters being promoted. Yes, any game store I went into now had posters of King of Fighters 2003 on the wall. And every gaming magazine I picked up now had ads with Ash Crimson staring you in the face. And I'm not saying that this was the first time SNK ever started advertising to Western audiences. No, far from it. They've been doing it this entire time. But there was definitely a push happening now. They realized American audiences had largely ignored their series in the past, and they wanted to make sure that didn't happen again. In fact, they went so far that I've mentioned several times throughout this retrospective that there have been dozens of Japanese manga or Chinese manhwa based around the King of Fighters. And that was no exception for King of Fighters 2003. It did have a Chinese manhwa based around it, and it actually got an officially translated English release, the very first time that ever happened with an SNK comic. SNK was serious about this. After everything that they had been through, they were ready to finally reach out and grab this new audience and make a splash with this new storyline. So, did they succeed? Well, let's finally delve into King of Fires 2003 and find out. King of Fires 2003 launched in arcades on December 12th, just barely getting in under the buzzer to keep that annual release going. And just like how the NES Saga changed things up by creating a four-team structure and introducing the assist-based striker system, this new Saga wanted to spice things up and change the formula as well. So they decided to completely revolutionize the team structure of the series. Before, you would each pick the order of your three characters, then when one character lost, the next character would go out. But now, you would pick a leader for your team, then you would decide who would go out first, but now you could swap out with your other party members at any time, and as soon as the character was KO'd, the match would continue as your next character instantly jumped in. I've heard a lot of people say that these changes were made to make the game more similar to the Marvel vs. Capcom series, but I haven't been able to find any actual quotes from anyone at SNK to say whether or not this was intentional. However, intentional or not, yeah, this was definitely lined up more with the versus games than with the classic KOF formula. The gameplay was much quicker as a result, and some people really enjoyed the faster pace, but other people complained that a lot of KOF's identity was lost because of this. Now even though this was drawing comparisons to the Versus games, there were a few big distinctions that kept KOF feeling unique. For starters, in the Versus games, whenever a character was tagged out, they would regain back some of their health. But that didn't happen here. Now in KOF 2003, if a character was low on life, then they were just low on life. You couldn't swap out to recover any of that back. So, you might be asking, what exactly was the point of swapping out characters then? Well, the obvious reason was that you might have a character out there who was a bad matchup for your opponent, so you could swap them out for a character who was a better fit. But there were two other reasons for it. 
First up, as with all the previous games, every character had access to super moves that would use up one bar of meter. However, as I said, when you formed your team, you would pick a team leader. And your leader would have access to an extra super that would use two bars of meter. So think of it like this. You got your leader out there, but you don't have enough bars to use their special leader super. And you don't know if you'll be able to survive long enough to be able to build up that meter. Well, just swap them out with another teammate, have that character build up the meter, then call your leader back in when you're ready to use that move. But the big reason for swapping characters in and out is that you could do a special input that would lead into an attack, and then another party member would come flying in to combo off the attack that you just performed. This was a great way of setting up your opponent for big damage. I've seen videos of people online doing crazy stuff comboing off of this. And here's the great thing about this. Let's say your opponent is trying to zone you out and you can't get in. Well, then you just do this attack, and sure, your initial attack will completely whiff because your opponent is on the other side of the screen, but then your teammate will still come flying in right into your opponent's face, easily allowing you to close that distance and start pressuring them. So, while swapping out of the Versus system had more of a defensive purpose, swapping out in KOF 2003 had more offensive benefits. Now, it is worth pointing out that in order to perform these attack swaps, you would have to spend a bar of meter. And I'll admit, when it comes to spending my meter in games, I'm a bit stingy. I always refer to your resources in fine games as your cool moves budget, so I always like to ask, is the effect that I get off of this ability worth the amount of my cool moves budget that I have to spend? And I'll admit, just saying it out loud, you have to spend a bar a meter to get your character to instantly swap in, doesn't really sound worth it to me. However, after playing the game, yeah, it's totally worth it, and I love doing this. Bringing in your character so quickly opens up so many opportunities and has so many uses. And best of all, your meter in this game builds fast. You can waste this move and it won't matter because you'll get that meter back in no time. And best of all, you start the match with three full bars already. This game starts each fight off telling you, here, here's everything, just go nuts with it. I love this, and by giving you so many resources, it leans into the faster combat that this game was going for. Now, as for the presentation of the game, I mentioned that the games during the NES saga were starting to show their age, and... Yeah, that's sadly still true here. Don't get me wrong, SNK still knows how to make good-looking sprites. They are wizards when it comes to in-between frames. But all the artistic talent in the world could only push the hardware so much. You see, this was the final game SNK would make using the Neo Geo multi-video system hardware which is literally the same hardware they'd been using since the very first King of Fighters, almost a decade earlier. Yes, the same hardware running this was also running this. As I said, this game looked a little dated, but when you realize the engine running it was practically operating on steam power, it's damn impressive. But now let's get to arguably the most important part of any new KOF game, the roster. Who was returning, who was new, and whose team would everyone be on? Starting off simple, Team Artifying was Ryo, Yuri, and Robert, who now return to his old Shoto-style inputs. Ikari Warriors was Ralph, Clark, and Leona. K-Dash was joining Whip and Maxima, but since K-Dash was no longer the hero of the storyline, he could no longer call his team Team Hero. So his new team would simply be called Team K-Dash, because K-Dash is a man who will not put any more work into anything than he has to. Then Team Japan was made up of Benimar, Goro Diamond, and Shingo, who had spent the last year training with Saisu to learn some Kusanagi fighting techniques. But now we start getting to some interesting new developments on these teams. Team Women Fighters still saw King and Mai, but now they are being joined by Blue Mary. Team Korean Justice was made up of Kim, Junhoon, and Chang, meaning for the first time ever, there was a King of Fighters without Choi Boon. Thank God! Sorry. Sorry. I know that's very disrespectful to the Troy fan out there, but even after fighting him in nine games for this retrospective, he was still a headache for me. So yeah, I didn't miss him, but he wasn't the only staple not returning. For the very first time, Andy Bogard would not return, as Team Fatal Fury was now made of Joe Higashi, Terry Bogard, now rocking his leather jacket from Galro Mark of the Wolves. And speaking of Galro Mark of the Wolves, their final member was Tzok. Yes, Tzok was a masked Mexican wrestler who fought under the moniker The Griffin, and he believed in fighting for justice and tried to act as a hero to children around the world. I honestly love this character. He might be one of my favorite grapplers in any fighting game. He's just so full of personality, and his flipping and flying grabs are just so fun to perform. While well, we're talking about Galro and Mark of the Wolves, for the first time since KOF 97, we saw the return of Team Outlaw, made up of Yamazaki and Billy Kane, but now they're being joined by Gato. 
Gato is an angry, ruthless master of Chinese boxing. However, unlike Billy Kane and especially Yamazaki, Gato isn't really a villain. Sure, he's cold and violent, but he's not out to commit crimes just to get revenge. When he was younger, his father killed his mother, and so he left his sister Hotaru behind to go on a quest for vengeance, which is the exact reason why he's on this team. Geese Howard has taken an interest in this year's tournament, and so he tells Gato that he has some information on his father, and if he wants it, then he's going to have to join his team. Next up, for the first time ever, there was no Psycho Soldiers team in a KOF, as Sai Kinzu was off trained to master his new Dragon Spirit powers, so Athena had to lead her own brand new team, which just happens to be the worst named team in the entire series. Team High School Girls. The team would be made up of Athena, the young sumo wrestler fan Hinako Shijo, and the brand new character, Malin. Now, Malin, despite her age, is actually a deadly fighter who uses knives, hammers, blades, and all sorts of other weapons. She was created to essentially be an Echo Fighter for Choi, because since he wasn't returning, the devs wanted to make a character with similar moves for all the Choi players out there. Malin works for a secret spy organization, which is why she joined Athena's team. She says her organization knew that Athena was looking for teammates, implying that Malin's organization might be spying on the KOF characters. And that plotline would go... nowhere. Yeah, it kind of feels like they had some plans for Malin at some point in time, but it never comes back up again. So yeah, there is a knife-wielding assassin who wants to team up with Athena. Don't worry about why. Kyoniori would return as individual entries, at least that's how it appears on this log screen, we'll get back to that later. Which means that we now come to our final team. The brand new Team Hero. The leader of the team was of course the previously mentioned Ash Crimson, and I talked a bit about Ash's personality and his design, but I didn't really bring up who he was, his origin. And there's a reason for that. We don't really know any of that. At least, not yet. In the first game, Ash's background was still being kept largely a mystery. Although, like Kyo and Kate Ash, he did have flame powers, but his flames were green. A very unnatural color that helped add a mystery to him. Why did he have powers like the previous two heroes? Was he connected to them? These were just a few of the many questions that players had. Now, joining him on this team were his two friends, Shin Wu, an aggressive backstreet brawler from Shanghai who lives to fight strong opponents, so much so that Shin Wu isn't even his name. It's a title he gave himself because Shin means God and Wu means battle. Then the third member of his team was Duo Lon, and Duo is a good guy. He's got a strong sense of justice and a caring heart, so you'd probably never expect that he was actually a member of the Hizoku Guild of Assassins and the son of their former leader, Ron. Hey, remember Ron? The assassin who betrayed his clan to go and work for Nest in the last story, and then he betrayed Nest there at the end, kind of off screen? To this day, he's still never been playable, but his presence has continued to be felt throughout the series. At least for the next few games. And Duo Lon was making it his mission to hunt his father down and make him pay for what he'd done. So, we've got all our fighters finally in order, but who was the big villain this time around? Who would you be going up against in the end? Well, that's where things got really interesting, because you see, King of Fighters was known for having a big final boss, but then there would typically be a sub-boss that you would fight right before them. However, King of Fighters 2003 did something that we'd never seen before, as it didn't just have a sub-boss, but it also had a mid-boss that you would fight halfway through the arcade ladder, and two alternate final bosses. I'm pretty sure that means KOF 2003 wins the title of most bosses in a canonical KOF game, and many of these bosses are some pretty deep references to previous KOF games. For starters, when you make it halfway through the arcade ladder, you get a glimpse of a mysterious woman reciting a prayer, and behind her, out of the shadows, comes a dark evil version of Kyo. This is Kusanagi, and I don't just mean, oh, like Kyo Kusanagi, no, remember when I talked about KOF 2002, and I mentioned that for that non-canonical dream match, they decided to make an evil version of Kyo just for the heck of it, and they called him Kusanagi? Yeah, this is him! They took the evil Kyo clone and actually put him in a mainline game, meaning this might be one of the only times I've ever heard of a non-canonical fighting game character being made canon in a later game. But this is when things get really interesting. If you beat Kusanagi with a regular or special attack, then the game continues and eventually you face the mysterious woman who summoned Kusanagi, but she finds your strength unworthy. 
so she uses her powers to banish you away. Suddenly, you find yourself in a floating air fortress, the Sky Noah, and the owner of this ship appears before you and introduces herself as the host of this year's King of Fires tournament, Rose Bernstein. You know, like Rugal Bernstein? This is the daughter of the original boss of King of Fighters, and she tells you that for the finale of this year's tournament, you have to face her brother Adelheid, who basically plays like his old man did, except he's not nearly as aggressive. And there's a reason for that. Adelheid isn't a monster like his father. He's noble and doesn't want any part of his father's dark legacy. However, for some reason, his sister is acting strangely out of character. She's being bloodthirsty and demanding that Adelheid keep fighting even after he loses. He doesn't know what's gotten into his sister. And neither do you, because then the game just ends. And there's a reason for that. Because this was not the true ending. No, you see, to get the true ending, you have to finish Kusanagi off with a super move. And I'm just going to give you all a big tip right now. I played this game on both the PS2 and the PS4 as part of the Arcade Archives collection, which is why sometimes the footage you're seeing has 2D backgrounds and 3D backgrounds. And if you're all interested in this game and you want to pick it up, buy it digitally as part of the Arcade Archives collection. Because those let you create save states, and they are a lifesaver. Nothing is worse than getting halfway through the arcade ladder and then screwing up against Kusanagi, and now you're banned from getting the true ending. But if you manage to beat Kusanagi with a super, then when you face the mysterious woman, she finds your strength to be suitable, and she reveals herself to be... Shizuru. Yes, the third member of the Three Sacred Treasures, Kyoniori's ally against Orochi in the original storyline, she was back. And while Rose was the host of this year's tournament, Chizuru was the one who put it all together. And as you can tell, something wasn't quite right about her either. She uses the power of her sacred mirror to summon out a reflection of her dead sister Maki. Now, when Chizuru originally appeared in King of Fires 96, she served as the sub-boss for that game as well. But if you challenged her and you had Chizuru on your team, then the game would say that that wasn't Chizuru you were fighting in the tournament, but instead it was a reflection of Maki being summoned out by the mirror. So even though I'm sure some of you might think it's a little bit odd for them to just suddenly whip out Maki for this storyline, it's actually a callback to something that had already been established in a previous game. From there, you have to fight a two-person team made up of Chizuru and Maki, and let me just say, oh, this fight is a headache. It's not really tough, but Chizuru already had the power to make duplicates of herself that jump and run across the stage, now she's got a duplicate fighter that does the same thing that she can swap in and out with. And it's made even worse because the AI in this game, well, it's not really difficult, but it is super agile. Out of all the KO of games I have played for this retrospective, I haven't seen one where the computer just spammed that dodge roll this much. So you've got two different versions of Chizuru that can swap in and out with themselves, both of which can create duplicates that run all over the stage, and they're constantly dodge rolling left and right past all of your attacks. When you put all that together, this fight can feel like sensory overload. But after you beat Chizuru, you see strings that had been controlling her get cut, and a mysterious woman appears behind her. This is Botan, a woman with the ability to control others' minds and bodies like they were puppets. And she steps aside to reveal Mukai, a giant mountain of a man who reveals to you that they were the ones really behind this year's tournament. They needed someone to defeat Chizuru, but they couldn't do it themselves because they had to keep their presence a secret for now. So they used Botan's power to manipulate Chizuru into starting a new King of Fires tournament, so that way a strong warrior would hopefully appear to defeat her. Why did they need Chizuru defeated? So that way it would weaken the seal around Orochi. Yes, that's right, we're going back to Orochi. I mentioned that Ash Crimson was a very interesting choice for a protagonist because you would think that after everything SNK had gone through, they'd want to play things safe. Well, while they were taking chances on their new hero, they were definitely playing it safe with the overall story. Because Orochi is once again front and center. A lot of fans even refer to this storyline as the Orochi Saga Part 2, because this is very much a back to basics plot. At least in the beginning, it's going to get a lot more complicated as we go along. From there, you had to fight Mukai, and this is actually one of my favorite boss fights in the series. In terms of difficulty, he's right smack dab in the middle, being a challenge, but not impossible, and I dig that he's got a common theme going. I've never really been a fan of villains who just have a thousand random abilities. I like a villain who has a shared motif. And Mukai is built like a mountain, so he fights with rocks. 
He summons out giant pillars to come down from the ceiling or spring up from the ground. He can grab you and turn you to stone, and he has a full screen super that can also petrify you. Just in terms of flavor and presentation, I really dig him. The only problem with this fight is that his hitbox is insane when he does certain moves. He will do his stomp attack and just slide his whole body through you like Shadow Cat. Like, it's so wonky, it's actually kind of gross at times. It almost feels like a glitch. But who cares about that? Check out this stage! Fighting in front of the throbbing blood red seal of Orochi makes this feel like a final boss fight. It really gives this that feeling that you have to stop this guy here and now or else that big pulsating mound of evil is going to wake up. When you win, your heroes are then whisked away as they wonder what the heck all that was about and Mukai joins a group of shadowy figures who promise that this isn't over. Now there's a few things worth pointing out in these team endings. For starters, in the Akari Warriors ending, the Orochi seal being weakened causes Leona to briefly transform into her Orochi form and Ralph and Clark have to subdue her. Also, speaking of the Akari Warriors, here's a fun fact for you. In every other King of Fighters game, the canonical winner of the tournament was whichever team was that game's team hero. But not in here. In King of Fighters 2003's official story, the Akari Warriors were the ones who faced Adelheide, meaning they were the official winners of that year's tournament. Good for them! They've been doing this for nine years straight now. It's about time they took the trophy home. In fact, while we're talking about who fights who, the Akari Warriors beat Adelheide, but there were two bosses in this game. So, who officially challenged Mukai? You're probably expecting it to be Ash Crimson, since he was the hero of this saga, but nope, it was Kadash. Yeah, even after his storyline was all wrapped up, Kadash still was on the clock for big boss cleanup duty. Well, then what exactly was Ash doing during this time? I mean, this was his storyline, and he was still letting the last protagonist take the glory? What was his team up to? Well, they were busy splitting up. Yeah, after failing to make it to the finals, Shinwu says see ya, Duo Lon sends his Ron nearby and goes after him, and Ash... Well, Ash says now it's time for him to start his true plan. I mentioned the idea behind Ash Crimson was, hey, what if our new hero was actually a villain? But so far, he hasn't really done anything villainous. That's where the secret ending comes into play. Yes, if you put in a secret code on the character select screen, then you can unlock Chizuru and once again form the three sacred treasures team. Then you get to see what happens after Kadash and his team beat the mind control Chizuru and Makai. Kyo and Iori arrive and help Chizuru to the Orochi seal. Luckily, the seal still seems to be intact, though. Whoever these mysterious villains were, their plans had failed because Chizuru still lives and she still had the power of the sacred mirror. To which Ash Crimson says, Sacred mirror powers? Don't mind if I do! Ash then appears behind Chizuru and using some strange new powers that we've never seen before, takes her mirror and her powers for himself. Using Chizuru's new powers, he then teleports away, but not before turning to Yori and telling him that he's next, leaving Kyo to swear revenge against this strange new opponent. And that's how the first chapter of this new saga ended. Mechanically, I really dug the new tagging system. They spiced it up enough to make it feel unique, and they gave you enough resources to play around with it, and there were some interesting new characters. But when it comes to the new storyline, so far, it was a big question mark. And I don't mean like how the Ness Saga was a big question mark because I didn't read the manga so I had no idea what anyone was talking about. No, this time that was on purpose. The Ash Saga was meant to be ominous. So far, this was a story that was shrouded in mystery. Who were these new villains? What was Ash Crimson up to? Why was Oroji being involved in all this? Audiences had a lot of questions after playing this game. And luckily, they wouldn't have to wait that long to get answers. King of Fighters 11 was released on- WAIT A SECOND! 11 isn't a year! I mean, okay, I guess it was, but I'm pretty sure SNK didn't exist that long ago. Yes, folks, you probably know this by now, but even though these games were managing to keep up their annual releases, they did keep getting pushed back further and further, and eventually they just couldn't keep it up. 
For the first time ever, King of Fighters had to skip a year, and rather than naming the game King of Fighters 2005 and making people think, wait, did I miss a game? They just decided to start numbering the titles. A smart decision, although I kind of wish they had started it with 2003. Then not only would they have changed up how they numbered these games with the very first game of the new saga, but also that means they could have called it King of Fighters X. Come on, that's just badass. You walk into the store and you see King of Fighters X on the wall, you're picking that game up. But it wasn't just the development time of each individual release, the game also ended up skipping a year because, as I said, SNK was back, and they were trying to strike while the iron was hot. They were pumping out more games now than they had in years. Multiple new Metal Slugs, Neo Geo Battle Coliseum, SVC Chaos, and a whole new fighting game that... we'll actually get back to later. So yeah, SNK was busy at the time, and if that wasn't enough, SNK had to learn how to put this game on a brand new hardware. I mentioned before that all the previous KOF games were all made for the Neo Geo MVS, but in 2004, SNK signed a contract with gaming company Sammy to start using their hardware, the Atomus Wave. This would hopefully allow the game to look and function better than any game before it. And when it comes to the gameplay, you can definitely see some improvements. It feels even quicker than before, and there were plenty of new mechanics introduced to make it an even more technical game compared to King of Fires 2003. You still had your power gauge that you could use for supers and quick swapping with your teammates, but now you also had a skill gauge that slowly filled up on its own, building up to two slots. And then you could use those slots for more defensive mechanics. So okay, gameplay-wise, this new system was working out for them just fine. But as for looking better, yeah, uh, I gotta be honest with you, the sprite work looked a little bit better, but it wasn't exactly the huge leap in quality you would expect from moving to brand new hardware. In fact, there were many times that I even noticed the pixels starting to create a buffering layer between the characters in the background, and once I saw that, I couldn't unsee it. And speaking of those backgrounds... Yeah, we have to talk about these. I've mentioned several times that King of Fires always had stellar backgrounds, just lively and vibrant scenes full of energy and enthusiasm, but for King of Fires 11, the developers said that they wanted these stages to feel more realistic. And... uh... Well... Hey, the good news is you did it. Mission accomplished. The bad news is nobody was asking for that. Yeah, these settings feel more realistic, and when I say realistic, I mean boring. King of Fires 11 is often criticized by fans for having the worst backgrounds in the series because, well, just look at them. Sure, that building looks all right, and the sky is a nice shade of blue, and those guys clean the floor all right, but this is KOF. Where's the excitement? Where's the crowds cheering you on? Where's the crazy Easter eggs? Where's the big bombastic set decorations? Where's the kaboom? There's supposed to be an earth shattering kaboom in these stages. These sets are just so dull. However, while the backgrounds dropped the ball hard, the one spot where the presentation of King of Fires 11 really shined was the music. This game is easily in my top five favorite KOF soundtracks. Every track is overflowing with personality. The Secret Agents theme has this perfect jazzy smoky bar feel to it. The new Rivals theme is elegant while still being heavy and sounding like it means business. And the hard rock mechanical style of K-Dash's theme? When I think of the theme for Team K-Dash, this is the track that comes to mind. So the gameplay and the soundtrack are still great, but that's not my favorite thing about King of Fires 11. No, I actually love this game, and it's for admittedly a really stupid reason. You see, when it comes to any series that's been going for a long time, and especially any fighting game that's been around for multiple installments, I will always have a soft spot in my heart for the weird one. And King of Fires 11 is indeed the weird one. Not for gameplay reasons, I mean, sure, the attack mechanic is still very different, but that was in the last game. What makes this game the weird one is the roster. This is easily the craziest roster in the history of King of Fighters. Almost every single team has something to make you ask, I'm sorry, what? Let's start with the basics. First up is Team Hero made up of Ash and Shin Woo, but now they're being joined by a brand new character, Oswald. Oswald is an Irish hitman who fights with playing cards while striking elaborate over-the-top poses, and he agrees to work for Ash because he's hunting down a rare drug called Dragon Pills, and Ash says he'll provide him with information on how to find them. Next team, Art of Fighting, was Ryo, King, and Yuri. Not that odd, but this was the very first time that we ever saw that combination of characters together. 
Then the Akari Warriors was Ralph, Clark, and Whip, meaning that for the very first time since she was introduced, Leona was not in the game. Then the Psycho Soldiers return with Athena and the returning Sai Kinzu, who had spent the last year training to master his new Dragon Spirit powers. Yeah, that all kind of got resolved off screen. And then joining them is the brand new character Momoko, a capoeira dancer with her own psychic powers who Athena is helping to train. And I mentioned the sprite work in this game isn't much better than the last game, but I do have to admit, Momoko's animation is really darn impressive for the time. This is like the one area I can look at and say, yeah, I guess this actually is on a new engine. Also, she has a giant Kamehameha wave as a super. I wasn't expecting that. Then Team K-Dash returns once again with K-Dash and Maxima, but now in the third spot was Kula Diamond. Yes, the child soldier created to exterminate K-Dash was now joining him, and this would become their team setup for the next few games, and I have to say, this is one of my favorite KOF teams. Not for mechanical reasons, but as I said in the Nest Saga, I've always loved stories about troubled and damaged characters all coming together to form a family, and this team totally takes that dynamic. I love their interactions, K-Dash being the angry loner who doesn't want to admit that he cares about the people around him, Kula, the young kid who's learning how to grow up and be a human being again from these fellow outcasts, and then of course Maxima being the older brother slash father figure keeping them all together. I love this pack of misfits. Also worth pointing out, starting with this game, Team K-Dash started working for Hydern. Yeah, with the new mysterious villain group popping up, Hydern realized his team of Ikari warriors might not be enough to deal with it. So he brought together a whole mess of special soldiers to help combat this new threat. And seeing as how K-Dash and his team were now basically working as guns for hire and K-Dash's sister was already part of the Akari Warriors, they ended up becoming Hydern's backup squad. And they weren't the only ones Hydern was hiring. He needed people with special skills to investigate these new villains, so he put together Team Secret Agents, made of Ramon, Vanessa, and Blue Mary. It is worth pointing out that in the story, Seth is also a member of the team, but he decided to sit the actual tournament out. And while we're talking about new teams, SNK decided after introducing two characters from Galra Marker the Wolves into the last game, they would go ahead and give them their own team, named Team Marker the Wolves. It was made up of the returning Gato and Tizok, and their leader was B. Jenny, one of SNK's biggest fan favorite characters. She's a happy go lucky flirty pirate who was born to a wealthy British family, but left to chase adventure on the high seas along with her Lillian Knights, her special band of pirates who return with her in every single one of her appearance. Is. I'm sorry, zoom in. Is that Lau? The guy who got beat up in the intro to Real Bout Fatal Fury 2? That guy is a member of the Lillian Knights? Oh my god, he gets to return, but Rick Stroud gets left in the dustbins of history? What the hell? Anyway, speaking of Fatal Fury, not only does Andy not return, but neither does Joe Higashi. And instead, we get the weirdest Fatal Fury lineup of all time. Maybe of Terry, Kim Capwan, who now no longer is leading his own team, and Duck King. Yes, after just barely losing the popularity vote to make it into King of Fighters 97, Duck King finally got to officially join the cast. He's a funky fresh DJ in Southtown who fights with breakdancing moves while being cheered on by his pet chicken. Needless to say, he is another big fan favorite character. Speaking of weird assortments of characters, next is Team Anti-Kyoku Ginryu. And if you're wondering what Kyoku Ginryu is, it's the style of fighting that Ryo and his family use. In other words, this is the Art of Fighting Rivals team. And personally, I love that there's an Art of Fighting Rivals team. I mean, this entire series started off pitched as Art of Fighting vs. Fatal Fury, but while the Fatal Fury series kept getting new characters added left and right, Art of Fighting always just had the one team so I'm glad they finally got some more presents. Although, if you're expecting these guys to be any kind of a big threat, oh, you're in for a disappointment. This team is used more for comedy, which is fine by me. If you go back and play those old Art of Fighting games, they always had a very healthy sense of humor to them. And even in the King of Fire series, the Art of Fighting team always tended to have the more humorous innings, so it fits. The team is made up of the returning Aiji Kisaragi, the first time that he had canonically been in this series since the Rivals team in King of Fires 95, Kasumi Toto, who is really only here because she is continuing her search for her father and she thinks that teaming up with them might somehow help her with that, and Malin, who is here because apparently she hates Yuri because she thinks Yuri is too stuck up? Yeah, I'll be honest with you, I said they made Malin in the last game for people who missed Choice playstyle, and I think that's about as far as they thought things through. 
Don't get me wrong, I'm fine with Malin, and I'd be cool with him bringing her back and doing something interesting with her, but so far, she's kind of just being used to fill an empty roster spot. Now, as for the teams that are important to the plot, Kyo and Iori knew that they needed to hunt down Ash and whoever was messing with the Orochi seal. So they put their rivalry aside and finally became an official team. Problem is, Jizuru couldn't join them to reform the Three Sacred Treasures since her powers were gone, so she asked Shingo to join them. Then finally there was the new rivals team, made of Duo Lon, who did not approve of what Ash did to Jizuru in the last game and won answers, Benimaru, because he too was concerned about what was happening with Orochi, and because he's Benimaru and if your team is important to the plot, he's going to be there. And lastly, the leader of the team was the brand new character, Elizabeth Blantorch. Now, I'll get into who Elizabeth is and why she's important in a moment, but before we delve into that, let's talk about this roster. As I said, this is easily the weirdest KOF roster ever. Not just for all the bizarre new additions and new teams and new combinations, but also for all the characters who were left out. As I said, Leona and Joe Higashi were now gone for the very first time since they were introduced, but an even bigger loss, Mai Shiranui. Yes, one of the biggest stables of not just KOF, but of SNK in general, Mai Shiranui was gone from this roster. At least at launch. You see, there were also a ton of secret characters in the game, many of them in the arcade release. There were five different mid-bosses in the game, and how many supers you use to finish off enemies decide which one you would face. Returning from the last game was Adelhide, but everyone else was brand new. From the 3D mixed martial arts fighting game Bariki 1 was the game's protagonist Guy Tindo, as well as the final boss of the game Silver, who was basically SNK's version of Akuma. Then from Savage Rain, we got the game's boomerang wielding protagonist Sho Hayate, and then the bird clad assassin Jiazu, who is flat out broken in this game thanks to having a dozen different moves that hit all over the screen. Not gonna lie, when I ended up finally unlocking him, it was a pretty good time from then on out. It made the rest of the game a breeze. But those were the unlockable characters on the arcade release. When the game came to the PS2, it featured a wide variety of missions. You see, around this time, video game companies were realizing that with the arcade scene dying, they needed to provide single-player content for their fighting games. Mortal Kombat was the best example of this, but with the King of Fighters 11, SNK was trying their hand at it as well. They gave you a series of missions that could be anything from reflecting attacks to being up an opponent under a set of strict conditions. And by completing these modes, you can unlock a wide variety of secret characters, including EX Kyo, because there must always be an alternate version of Kyo, Robert Garcia, now with a very fancy new redesign, and unfortunately returning to his charge moveset. Then there was Terry Bogard's old master, Tung Fu Ru, Gato's sister, Hotaru Futaba, Mr. Big, Geese Howard, and of course, Mai Shiranui. Who, I will actually admit, is the one character in this roster I never managed to unlock, because in order to get her, you have to beat every single female character in the game with Mai on just one life bar. And man, I gotta respect SNK on that one. They just turned to the audience and said, oh, you want Mai in the game? Well, clearly it's because you main her and you're good with her, and it's not just because you want to see her bouncing around in a skimpy outfit, right? Yes, I'm sure that's the reason. I'm sure you're just a Mai main. Then in that case, you won't mind stepping into the octagon and proving it first. Yeah, all you fanboys at home say that you love Mai, well, you better be prepared to fight for that love. So, we got the entire roster out of the way, which means that now it's time for lore. Yes, as I said, the last game was loaded with a lot of mystery. Who is Ash? Why was he after the sacred treasures? Who are these new villains? Before this, with the Orochi Saga and the Ness Saga, SNK was making sure to load players up with tons of books and online journals to make sure that they knew all the ins and outs of the story. But here, SNK was being very coy. They were keeping the important details close to their chest. But now we were finally starting to get some information. And I do stress, SOME information. Because even when the story was all over and done, there were still some pretty solid chunks of information that were never explained. I played the games, read the wikis, and I still had to watch three lore videos on the story just to make sure that I understood everything. And all three of those lore videos had completely different versions of these events. But I've compiled all the information that we do know, and I've made my best estimates about what we don't know, to come up with a version of these events that I hope we can all find useful. Or, at least, comprehensive. So you remember in part one of this series where I talked about how Gaia, the will of the planet itself, decided it was done with us silly humans always mucking everything up? So it created Orochi, the embodiment of the planet's will to wipe humans out? Well, Orochi wasn't Gaia's only agent. 
The plan is a big place. They couldn't exactly trust Orochi to handle all of it. So while Orochi was running around destroying things in Japan, over in Europe, there was a group of Gaia loyalists called Those from the Distant Land. And they were all waging a war against mankind as well, all working for their own big powerful boss, Psyche. And while in Japan, there were three families warring against Orochi, in Europe, there was only one, the Bland Torch. And after a long battle, the Bland Torches were about to wipe Psyche and his followers out, but while Orochi had the power of nature, Psyche had the power of time. They had access to a giant gateway that could lead them through time. And thanks to the plans aligning just right, the door was powered up and this allowed Psyche and his followers to escape through the gateway into the future. Well, even if Psyche was gone, the Bland Torches knew that one day they would return, so it became their mission to train for that day. Cut to a decade ago, and the Bland Torches ended up adopting this young boy named Ash. His family, the Crimsons, had recently been killed, so they took Ash into their own family. And over the next 10 years, Ash and the Bland Torch daughter, Elizabeth, became close friends and established a real brother-sister relationship. That is, until one day when the Bland Torch home burned down and the entire family died except for Elizabeth and Ash. Only for Ash to then disappear soon after. Cut to a few months later and Elizabeth sees Ash in the King of Fires tournament and she decides to track him down to find out what happened. Well, as all of this was going on, those from his distant land arrived in the present and now they were going by the very appropriate name, those from the past. And they realized, hey, we weren't strong enough to take out the Bland Torches. And Orochi wasn't strong enough to take out the three sacred families. But now in the present, we know where Orochi is being sealed. So, let's awaken Orochi, absorb its power, then use the gate to go back in time and wipe the Bland Torch family out and succeed where originally we failed. Which leads us to the latest King of Fighters. Those from the past, man that name really does not roll off the tongue, those from the past failed to break the Orochi seal, but with Chizuru out of the picture, the seal is weakened. Well, as we learned back in King of Fires 97, if you want to wake Orochi up, nothing is better for that than good old fighting energy. Yes, if you're an evil organization in the SNK games and you're looking to power up your big secret weapon, whether it be a dark god or a space laser, nothing does the job like fighting energy. So, those from the past orchestrated another King of Fighters tournament to bring everyone together to make them fight. The Kanaga winner this year was Elizabeth and the Rivals team, and when they reach the championship, they find the stadium has been destroyed, and waiting for them is Xion, a deadly martial artist working for those from the past. Fun fact about Xion, originally they were going to appear in King of Fires 2003 as Ron's daughter. Hey, remember Ron? But that idea was eventually scrapped. However, when they needed a sub-boss for this game, they decided to bring Xion back, only they decided to change the character so that now they were a man. And I really like this fight. I think Xion is one of the most unique sub-bosses in the series, as they have different stances that they can fight with, using their own fists for quick precise strikes, a spear for some deadly range, and a rope whip for a whole new variety of attacks. I think this is a really cool fight, and I hope that Xion returns someday. Which might be kind of hard, because after you fight them, their boss opens up a portal and sucks Xion into another dimension in one of the most disturbing bits of body horror in the entire series. The portal opens further and out steps the big boss of the game, Magaki, who proceeds to transform into a bizarre, almost alien body. And uh, hey, here's an interesting little fact about Magaki. He's the worst. I first played this game a couple of years ago and I remembered him being bad. But until you actually go back in there and get into the fight, you forget just how bad he is. I say this with no small amount of exaggeration, Magaki is the worst boss in King of Fighters history. Not the hardest! No, I want to make that clear. I said in the last video that Ignis was the hardest KOF boss, and I stand by that. He is the hardest. But Magaki is the worst. Because even if Ignis was harder, Ignis at least made sense. Magagi, on the other hand, is a dozen different ideas that do not feel like they were tested together. Magagi feels like he was designed the same way that a five-year-old comes up with a superhero. They just keep throwing ideas out there with no concept of how to balance it all. Okay, so uh, he's got long arms, so his normal attack has good range. Uh, and he's got three different projectiles. No, wait, four different projectiles that all launch at you at the exact same time, one of which comes from behind you, 
Uh, oh, and he can also do an instant energy wall to block your attacks, and it also reflects projectiles, and he can also create orbs, invisible orbs, that float across the screen, and he can teleport, and he's got a super that hits the entire screen, and, uh, oh yeah, he can also make himself invisible. I am not making any of that up. Hell, I'm probably forgetting something. He just loads the entire screen up with random projectiles. And did I mention that this game has guard breaks? So you can't even just stand there and block the attacks waiting for an opening because he will break your guard and he will punish you for it. And in case you were wondering what all these attacks going off at the same time sound like, Hell, it sounds like hell. You have to learn how to jump and dodge roll around all of his crazy bullcrap, and then when you finally reach him, you have to hope that he doesn't decide to instantly put up his big exploding wall to keep you out or teleport away. And did I mention that his projectiles stay on the field even if he's being attacked? So even if you do manage to get in on him and start comboing him, a projectile that he already launched can reach you and knock you out. I am not kidding when I say half the footage I recorded of me playing King of Fighters 11 for this video is just of me fighting Magaki. Beating this boss took just as long as climbing the rest of the arcade ladder. But luckily, you will manage to beat him. At which point, Magaki opens up a portal to escape through only for Shion to reveal that they somehow managed to survive this, and they are still alive on the other side of that portal, so they decide to get revenge on Magaki for their betrayal by stabbing him through the chest with their spear. Good for you, Shion. I knew I liked you for a reason. And that brings us to the team endings, each of which were drawn by the returning SNK artist Nona. And hey, I said in part two, I know Nona is kind of a divisive artist, but I really like him, and I think these endings look great. Especially the sense of style that he brought to these characters. This is easily the most drip some of these characters have had in the entire franchise. Now as for the individual team endings, the Psycho Soldier's ending sees Ron swearing that he'll get Kinzo's dragon power soon. That literally never comes up again after this point. And the Fatal Fury ending sees Duck King and Terry going out partying with Chang and Troy as Kim gets drunk as he feels no one is taking him seriously. And oddly enough, this actually does come up again after this point. But beyond that, an interesting thing about this game is that many of these endings lead directly into each other. The Art of Fighting ending sees Ryo and King set up on a date by Yuri, then the anti kyoku Ginryo team's ending sees them trying to crash that date. Then the Secret Agent's ending sees them arriving on one of Hydran's ships. k Dash's ending sees that team on another ship listening to Hydran's plan, only for two of Psyche's followers to arrive and blow up one of those ships in the Akari Warriors ending. I really dig this idea of having endings that all tell a story together. It's a good way of encouraging players to go back through the arcade ladder multiple times. But the endings that really matter start with Ash. He tells Oswald that he finally has the info on the dragon pills that he was looking for. They belong to a Chinese drug lord, but that drug lord will only give the pills to someone who can defeat the cartel's top threat, Shin Wu. So Ash basically turns to this deadly hitman on his squad and says, Oh, you want that medicine? Cool. Kill my longtime friend for it. Great, that's it for me. Bye, everyone. And that was it. Ash left his friend Shin to fight for his life and then proceeded to peace out. Where did he go? Well, for that answer, we cut to the Kyo Iori team ending. Magaki might not have fully unleashed Orochi, but he did gather enough fighting energy to wake it up, which causes Iori to go mad with the Orochi blood riot. Iori ends up injuring both Shingo and Kyo, but before he can finish them off, Ash appears and made good on his promise from the last game and stole Iori's sacred treasure, causing Iori to lose his connection to Orochi as well as his flame powers. This all leads into the rival team's ending as Elizabeth confronts Ash. She wants to know why he left and why he's acting like this. He tells her that he's not the person she thought he was, taunting her and her team with Iori's purple flames, which are now his. He then uses the power of Chizuru's mirror to disappear, leaving them with the message that Kyo is next. So, this story is now ramping up. Big developments are being made and our heroes are facing threats on multiple fronts. You've got Orochi about to be revived, you've got those from the past looking to take over the world, and you've got Ash Crimson picking off our heroes one by one. And for the next installment, we would see the battle head to a brand new landscape. 
as SNK was leaving the PS2 era and now heading into the seventh generation of consoles, and it would be on these new platforms that our heroes would face their greatest threat yet. A danger far beyond anything that they had ever imagined as we finally come to- Whoa, hold on now. I'm sorry, but we can't go to the next game in the Ash Crimson Saga just yet. Because you see, as I said at the beginning of this episode, we're not just covering the Ash Crimson Saga today. We're covering what happened to King of Fires during the SNK Playmore era. And before SNK left the sixth generation of consoles, there was another venture that they went on. A little experiment that has its critics and its fans and even more critics, but it was an experiment that isn't just worth mentioning, it's worth mentioning right about now, because it does indeed tie into the Ash Crimson Saga. Not in terms of story, but more in terms of development. So before we can wrap up the story of Ash Crimson, let's return to where SNK began, to a story of two brothers taking on a crime boss in Southtown. No, no not. Not those guys. Yeah, these guys. I'm sorry, can we hear that announcer one more time? KOF! Maximum Impact! Oh god, yeah, that, that sets the tone for everything that's coming up. Okay, as I said, when SNK reformed as SNK Playmore, they were riding high. They were back, and they wanted to take advantage of that. So they started pumping out games at a rate we hadn't seen since the mid-90s. No idea was off the table, and if that meant making spin-offs of your big franchises, then so be it. And hey, you know something? King of Fire's 10th anniversary is coming up, so maybe we should celebrate that with something that's new, but also ties back to our roots, while also being a big mashup of the history of this series. Thus was born King of Fighters Maximum Impact. Now at first glance, you'll probably notice a few differences between this game and the mainline series, the larger stages, the lack of teammates, and oh yeah, a whole extra dimension. Yeah, remember this was during SNK's big western push, and what do westerners love more than 3D graphics? Americans love cheeseburgers, fast cars, and the third dimension, that's just a fact. And just like with King of Fires 2003, they decided to push this thing hard. I remember seeing ads for this all over the place. If I walked into an EB Games or a GameStop back in the day, I would see the intro to this thing being played on the TVs over and over. 
And again, at the time, I didn't really know what King of Fighters was. So when I saw Maximum Impact, I thought, oh, I guess that's what King of Fighters is. And I could not have been more wrong. Now, production on Maximum Impact began pretty much as soon as SNK Playmore was formed, as the company knew the series' 10th anniversary was coming up, so they wanted to do something special to celebrate. And their idea was to essentially create something unique, a standalone that fans of the series could enjoy for all the references, but new players could check it out without being bogged down with 10 years of continuity. Maximum Impact was about twin brothers in Southtown, Alba and Sori Mira. They worked for a gang that was led by a man named Fate, who Alba and Sori viewed as a father. Even though they were a gang, they were more of a Robin Hood, protected the people type of gang, and ever since Geese Howard's death, they had kept the peace in Southtown. Now, remember, Geese Howard died in the Fatal Fury timeline, but not in the King of Fighters timeline. So right off the bat, it's clear this timeline is sort of an amalgam of all the various SNK continuities. However, six months before the game begins, Fate was killed as a new gang, Mephistopheles, was moving into town, headed up by Duke, an intimidating giant of a man who is now ruling Southtown with an iron fist. Mephistopheles then decides to host a tournament to pull Fate's family out of hiding, and it of course attracts the attention of several other big SNK mainstays. As for who these other fighters were, there was Kyo, Iori, Leona, Kadash, Maxima, Seth, Terry Bogart, Mai Shirinui, Ryo, Yuri, Ralph, Clark, Athena, and making his very first playable appearance in a King of Fighters game, the star of Galro Margaret the Wolves, Rock Howard, the son of Geese Howard and Terry Bogart's adopted child and protege. Again, this is more proof that they were sort of merging all continuities into one, since over in the actual King of Fighters timeline, Rock was still a child at this point. But as for the new fighters, there was the game's protagonist, Alba Mira, a super serious fighter who might come off as cold, but he still has a strong sense of justice and dedication to protecting Southtown. Then there was his more jokey, flirty, capoeira fighting brother, Sori. Next up, Chai Lim, who was another student of Kim Kapwan, and just like him, she had a strong dedication to her training, but when she's not fighting, she's actually pretty cheerful and she loves to eat. In fact, according to her in-game biography, her favorite food is... Her teddy bear! Yes, I'm aware that is a typo, and it was probably meant to say favorite thing or favorite possession, but too late, it's in the game, it's now can that Chai Lim likes to eat stuffed animals, put it on the wiki. Chai Lim was created because originally they wanted to include Cape Cap 1 in the game, but they wanted to do something different with him. Just like how Ryo's father Takuma would often put on a mask and call himself Mr. Karate, they wanted to put a mask on Kim and call him Mr. Taekwondo but senior SNK staff members argued against this, so they scrapped Kim altogether and just created a brand new character instead. Next up, Lian Neville. Her parents were killed by Duke when she was 10 years old, and then he proceeded to raise her and train her to become a deadly assassin. She grew up hating Duke, but in the end, she does have some mixed feelings towards him, because even though he killed her parents, he is the one who ended up raising her, so it's sort of a real Thanos Gamora thing going on here. And the final new character was Minion Baird, a white magic witch who wanted to use her powers to bring peace to the world, and who was raised in such a fancy rich home that she knows almost nothing about how to act in the outside world. Here's Mignon! Mignon looks nice? Does Mignon look nice? Mignon quit! Mignon did it! Mignon did it! Yay! Fun fact, I hate Mignon. Now, despite all being original unique characters, they were each inspired by other KOF fighters. Mignon is based on Athena, and the Mira brothers are based on the Bogart brothers, the big boss of the game Duke is based on Geese Howard, Chai Lim is obviously Kim Kapwan, and Lian is based around Mai Shiranui. Although, I don't really see how that one overlaps. I mean, Mai is a bubbly, flirty ninja, and Lian is a cold-blooded secret agent. I don't really see how she's supposed to be a copy of Mai- Oh, never mind. Now, as I said, this was when SNK was really trying to change their track record of obscurity in America. So, for starters, they gave the Maximum Impact comic another English translation, but more importantly, as you could probably tell from that Mignon clip, they gave the game an English dub. And while many of these characters had been dubbed before for animes, this was the very first time SNK dubbed them in a game. So, how was it? Winner! Stand up! When you lose, it's the end. And we're not talking like in the movies here. <sighs> now I'm mad. Like this. Are you okay? <laughs> well then, how about a little contact? You got regrets? What do I care? Okay, we're playing for keeps here. I can't contain my blood rage. Uh. Hey, who wants to talk about that gameplay? 
Yes, if we're moving from the second dimension to the third dimension, then you can tell this is not going to be like your other King of Fighter games. And the gameplay was... Weird. A lot of the moves feel very loose. They feel like they're designed to link together, but then they just don't. And I don't even mean that I was trying combos out and those combos didn't work. No, the game even tells you this string of moves is a combo. They will definitely all link together. But then they just don't. There will be huge gaps in those combos that give the opponent enough time to block or counter, so it's really only a combo if the computer is willing to sit there and take it. And the controls are really clunky. There were so many times I thought my controller was broken because I swore I was inputting the commands correctly and they just weren't coming out. And I probably shouldn't complain about this since it's how I won many of my games, but your guard meter is made of tissue paper. So even if the computer is blocking, just keep attacking a few more times and eventually they'll break and they won't be able to defend for a while. It's cheap, but this entire game feels kind of cheap. And like in most KOFs, you still have that iconic dodge roll, but now you can use that dodge roll to go to the side. And it's when this game goes into that third dimension that you realize, oh, KOF moves do not work in this format. I applaud them for trying so hard to make all the return KOF characters play exactly the same as they do in the other games. But there are so many moves that just don't work the moment that you have the option to step around them. However, the combat is not what people remember about this game. What sticks out in everyone's minds when they remember this game is the costumes. Not so much the redesigns to any existing characters as they try to keep everyone looking the same, for better... and for worse. No, when I talk about the costumes, I mean SNK got their in-house artist Falcoon to design secondary costumes for every single character. And these costumes range wildly. You got some that look alright, Chai Lim's not bad, I actually dig short-haired Mai, Terry's got that Gal Rowe flavor going for him. But then you got some that are way out there, like Iori looks like he's about to appear on the cover of an early 2000s rock rap boy band album. And then you got the truly bizarre ones like Raver Leona, Matrix Seth, and Clark... 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 I don't think I need words for this one, but there is a reason why these redesigns look so wild. It's because the SNK higher-ups told Falcoon, listen, we want this game to sell, so we need a lot of characters, but we could only fit 20 in here. So make these alternate costumes look so different, it will make people feel like there are other characters in the game. Which is a hell of a strategy, but it worked. These alternate costumes feel like a full roster from a completely different game. And the customizations don't stop there. If you beat the game with any character, then you can unlock their rigging model, which basically means you can now add additional little accessories onto them. And sometimes it's just a small addition, but then you got other characters out here sporting full SNK cosplays or getting ready to hit up the furry conventions. Now as you make your way through the arcade ladder, a man named Hyena, who looks like he's a 70s cartoon game show host, will tell you little bits of the plot, until you make your way to the final match against Duke himself. Have you challenged him with Alba, Sori, or Lien? Then you start the fight against him in a graveyard, but after you win your first round, he'll become enraged and then smash the ground beneath you, causing the two of you to fall into a secret underground stadium filled with wealthy aristocrats cheering you on. And hey, I have a lot of problems with this game, but that stage transition is money. That is one hell of a way to ramp up the tension in your final boss fight. And Duke himself, yeah, he's a KOF boss. He's got supers that hit pretty much the entire stage, and he's got an infinite meter, meaning he can do some really dumb stuff like this. Oh yeah, this seems fair. And when you beat Duke, the screen goes dark and you find an ominous message left for you. Almost as if they're setting up for some kind of a sequel. Which, interestingly enough, no, they were not doing that. No, this game was originally meant to be a one and done. As I said, originally this game was only planned to be released in honor of King of Fire's 10th year anniversary. So, it was put out in 2004. In fact, originally SNK planned on calling it King of Fire's 2004. But that idea was scrapped when they realized that if they named it that, then people would think it was a sequel to King of Fire's 2003. And that was a smart call. I mean... When you were shifting from dated entries to numbered entries, you'd be insane to give this spin-off game that doesn't tie into your main games a dated title. I want you all to remember I said that in just a moment. 
I bring this date up because, as I said, they want this game to sell well in America, and in 2004, when this game was released, it sold over 100,000 copies in America. That was huge for SNK. How huge? The last King of Fighters to get an American home release was King of Fighters 2001, which didn't even sell half that number. So SNK knew they were onto something here, and they didn't just greenlight a sequel, they mapped out five more games. Yeah, they wanted this to become their next big series, so they plotted out a six-game storyline, and they went ahead and announced not only a sequel, they also announced that they were already working on the third game, Maximum Impact 360, for next-generation consoles. Because this is SNK we're talking about, and nobody jumps the gun like SNK. However, for the next game, Maximum Impact 2, they decided that they would hand the controls over to the artist who had designed the costumes for the last game, Falcoon. And before we go any further, I would just like to address something. Some people say Falcoon, some people say Falcon, and Falcoon himself has said that both are fine. So I'm going to keep saying Falcoon because it's what I've been using for years now. So yes, Falcoon was put in charge of this game, and apparently, SNK was fairly hands-off on the project. They gave Falcoon the keys to the game and just let him design the costumes, create the new characters, and build the various modes. Maximum Impact 2 is largely thought of as the Falcoon fan game because if you play this, it is very clear that this is the perfect video game for one specific guy. But before I go into more details about that, let's actually talk about Falcoon. Now, remember how I said the SNK Playmore era was a very divisive time for SNK? Falcoon is one of the best examples of that because some people love him, and some people can't stand him. Before starting this retrospective, I had always heard some pretty heated opinions on Falcoon, but it wasn't until I started doing research for this episode that I realized just how deep it went. Just typing in Falcoon and Maximum Impact into a Google search brought up so many forums of people just trash-talking the guy. And after reading through what everyone thinks of him, I don't know if there is any personality at SNK who is surrounded by so much misinformation and false assumptions. Almost every complaint I read about the guy could easily be fact-checked and proven wrong, so I was going to give you guys a little bit of a backstory on Falcoon, but instead, I think it might be a better use of our time if I just clear the air and put a lot of these misconceptions to rest. First off, as I said, Ash Crimson has a lot of haters. A lot of people out there do not like Ash Crimson, and those people tend to blame Falcoon for creating him. One problem with that, Falcoon did not create Ash Crimson. He didn't even design Ash Crimson. He just did the official artwork for King of Fires 2003. That's it. Ash was already fully created and designed before Falcoon ever saw him. Next, a lot of people talk smack about Falcoon because the common belief a lot of people have is that he started up a blog for his fan art, SNK found it and said, hey, this guy is good, and they instantly gave him his own game. This isn't even close to true. Falcoon spent years trying to break into the manga industry, but no one would give him the time of day, but then SNK had a scouting session at his college, he presented them with his portfolio, and they liked it, so they hired him. Yes, he didn't win the golden ticket, he went through the official channels. He was hired the way that SNK hired their artists. And as for the belief that he was just handed his own personal video game as soon as they hired him, he worked at that company since 1998 doing debugging on Extreme Rally, then he went on to do sprite work for the Neo Geo Pocket Last Blade game. Then he went on to do in-game or promotional art for half a dozen other games before finally doing the character design for Maximum Impact 1. In other words, no, he was not just given his own game after being hired. He worked for years for the company climbing the ladder until he had impressed the higher-ups enough to be trusted with this project. Speaking of his art, I've seen plenty of people say that he created self-insert OCs for Maximum Impact 2 because one of the characters in that game has a haircut that kind of looks like a haircut he used to have. But here's the thing, a lot of characters in that game have multiple hair colors either as part of their regular design or as their alternate colors. Guys, I think Falcoon just likes that haircut. It doesn't mean that he made self-insert OCs. That is one heck of an assumption to jump to. I wasn't going to address that one, but I saw a lot of people online saying that he admitted that these characters were self-insert OCs, and no, he's never said anything like that. And lastly, Falcoon left SNK a few years later, and since then, none of the Maximum Impact characters have been seen or heard from in anything else, so a lot of Maximum Impact fans claim that he has the rights to the characters and he won't give them back to SNK. 
You guys must not know what it means to be an artist for a massive gaming corporation because believe me, outside of a few very specific instances, that's not how any of this works. Falcoon himself has even confirmed that no, he does not own the rights to any of these characters, SNK does, and they can bring them back whenever they want. So there, I just wanted to get some of that out of the way now because, don't get me wrong, Falcoon is certainly an interesting figure, and there are certainly things in his career worth critiquing, believe me, we'll get to that in a second. But as I said, this guy gets so much hate for stuff that he never did, never said, and just isn't true. So, let's get to the thing that he actually did, which was being lead producer on Maximum Impact 2. Maximum Impact 2 is... I'm just gonna say it. It's a weird game. I know I said Maximum Impact 1 was weird. This is even weirder. Because so many people hate parts of this game, but absolutely love other parts of the game. And I totally get that. This might very well be my number one fighting game guilty pleasure because I love this game. It is a ton of fun to me. But if you ask me point blank, is it good? Um, well, what exactly is your definition of good? Let's start with the combat. I said that the combat in the last game was loose, like they wanted a lot of these moves to link together, but at the same time the controls felt clunky, like it just wasn't reading my inputs. Well now the clunkiness is gone. Now everything feels like it's working just fine, every time that I hit a button the correct command comes out. But the combat is even looser. And don't get me wrong, I can enjoy a loose fighting game. You give me a game where a lot of moves all link together and I'm happy with that. But this game while feeling loose, doesn't feel smooth. It doesn't feel like stuff is designed to flow together. It feels like rather than testing the combat and mechanics, they just said, screw it, just let everything work. This is the definition of a button masher. You mash buttons, things happen. But you know something? That's not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes having a game where you can just mash your way to victory is fun. And the sound design is pretty great for that. Every hit sounds like you're shattering boulders, which I know some people will find ear grating, but it does make it feel like every little thing you do has an impact to it. So, is the combat good? Mmm... No... It's actually pretty stupid. But it's a fun stupid. It is the equivalent of a big Hollywood blockbuster where the entire idea is you just turn your brain off and you'll enjoy yourself, and you know what? Sometimes that's alright! Sometimes you don't need anything else. Not everything has to be a perfectly tight and balanced experience. If it feels good to hit buttons, then sometimes that's enough. And as for the presentation, I thought the last game looked a little too dim. The colors were too muted for me and the graphics weren't as sharp as I'd like them to be. But now things look cleaner. The colors pop more. These models look... Okay, still not great. Iori, I swear, it looks like you are rocking the world's worst comb over. Be careful you don't stand next to any fans or that puppy is going to blow right off. Although, while we're talking about the graphics and the character models, I was really going to try and avoid talking about this. It was certainly present in the first game, but it was something that I could avoid bringing up. But as I played through the second game, and especially as we will soon see in the third game, I realized, yeah, there's no way of getting around this. I apologize to everyone out there for being crass, but there's no other way of putting this. The Maximum Impact games might very well be the horniest thing King of Fires has ever done. I mean, I joked about Lian's character design in the first game, but in Maximum Impact 2, we are reaching critical cheesecake levels. And if you look at his artwork, it's clear that Falcoon really likes sex appeal. And don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to be a prude or anything. You want sexy characters in your fine game? That's fine, I'm not here to judge. But there are moments where I couldn't help but roll my eyes. I mean, even the dead or alive devs are laughing at these jiggle physics. But hey, what do you say we get off this subject as quickly as we possibly can and talk about literally anything else? Like, where the game gets nuts. The thing that makes this sequel stand out for me. The roster. All the characters from the last game return, but now they're being joined by Kula Diamond and Billy Kane, as well as a few new characters. There's Nagasi, a brash young girl who was genetically engineered to be a perfect weapon, and now works for the bad guys so that way she can test out her powers. Then there's Luis Mary 
who isn't just the sub-boss of the game, she's also hyped up and heavily focused on like they were setting her up to be something important for a later game. She was the daughter of a rocket scientist who through some strange unexplained process gained cosmic powers and is now out to warn the heroes of what the big boss of the game is up to. Now that might not sound like a lot of new characters, but that's just what the game starts with. There were also a ton of unlockable characters, and you know how I said SNK let Falcoon take the reins on this one, and it felt like they backed off and gave him full control? Nowhere is that more clear than in the unlockable characters. Everyone else in the game feels like they make sense being here. These unlockable characters though? They are clearly just Falcoon going down his wish list. SNK gave him a blank character sheet and he got to work building that roster. First up, Kim Kepuan, makes sense. Then B. Jenny, as I said, she's a fan favorite, plus now that we know Falcoon stays in women, yeah, that tracks. Then Nightmare Geese. Why Nightmare Geese? Why Geese's ghost from Fatal Fury real bout and not actual Geese Howard? Well, as we said, Geese is confirmed dead in this timeline, so his ghost does make sense. Or maybe Falcoon just liked Nightmare Geese more, who knows. Then you got Richard Meyer. He was one of the enemies in the very first Fatal Fury game, but since then he's just been a recurring character in the King of Fires and Fatal Fury games as the owner of the Pow Pow Cafe where all the Southtown characters like to hang out. It's an interesting choice. As I said, he had only ever been playable in one game, so it is a little bit odd, but it's not too crazy. You know what is crazy? Lily Kane. Yes, Billy Kane's younger sister. She's often been mentioned in Fatal Fury and King of Fighters, but this was her first and only playable appearance. People have wanted this character to be playable for years, and this is the only time it ever happened, because screw it, Falcoon thought it would be cool. Then you know what? How about we start warping space and time and bring Hanzo Hattori from Samurai Showdown into the game? Why? You know the answer, because Falcoon liked Hanzo Hattori. So much so that Nagasi even uses several of his attacks in the game already, so Falcoon liked Hanzo Hattori so much, he put him in here twice. Then Fiolina Jeremy from Metal Slug. Yes, another massive SNK fan favorite character. People have won her in KOF forever. Has it ever happened in the mainline games? No. Has it happened here in this weird spinoff? Sure, why not? All right, those were some weird picks. But let's get downright nutty. Mr. Karate. Oh, so you mean Ryo's dad Takuma is in here wearing his Mr. Karate mask? No, of course not. That would make way too much sense. This is Mr. Karate 2 from Bariki 1. Yes, in that game, Ryo Sakazaki, 10 years after the events of Art of Fighting, popped up and was now using his dad's old moniker and fighting a black gi, and that's the Mr. Karate that we have in this game. Speaking of alternate versions of characters already in the game, we got classic Kyo Kusanagi, then we got Gaoro, Mark of the Wolves, Terry Bogard, now going by the name Wild Wolf, and lastly, Armor Ralph which is just Ralph Jones wearing special body armor that makes it so that he doesn't take hit stun in combat. Yes, that's right. They took one of the strongest characters in King of Fighters and they gave him armor on all of his attacks because Falcoon loves Ralph and this is his game, so he is going to make Ralph as broken as possible. Then there are a handful of new characters you can unlock. Ninon Bert, who is the black mage sister of Minion and is basically anime Wednesday Adams. Hyena, the goofy tournament host from the last game, is now playable, and thank god, because I'm sure we were all asking for that. And lastly, you can unlock the boss of the game, Jivatma, who feels like he comes from a JoJo's Bizarre Adventure fanfic. And before you ask, yes, they all still have English dubs. Did they get any better from the last game? Oh yeah. I'll bet you're thinking you're pretty hot with the ladies. If you want to live your life as a human, just go. Leave here now. Even though I don't want to fight a woman, I won't be leaving either. You're a bit too dramatic. I'll save question sessions for later. Are you ready for battle? Very well. Come to me. If you think you can defeat me in your fallen state. <laughs> Nope! But you will be happy to know that you can now set the game to use the original Japanese language, which is totally worth doing because it means you'll get to hear the greatest Terry Bogart line read of all time. 
Jesus! And how do you unlock all these characters? Well, you can do it by beating the game or by completing missions, which is also how you unlock new colors for your characters, and this is where the game wins me over. As I said, the combat is mindless, but it's still fun. However, that's not enough of a reason for me to praise this game. That's where the missions come in. I've said it before, and I'll say it till I'm blue in the face, it is important for fighting games to have single player content. And unlocking stuff in that single player content is fun. And there are so many missions in this game. Some of them are really creative stuff, like you have to collect enough coins around the stage while you're fighting your opponent before time runs out. Or some of them are real head scratchers that are actually pretty smart. Like, they'll give you a certain amount of meter with a pre-selected character, and you have to defeat your opponent with that amount of meter in a very limited amount of time, so you'll have to plot out the exact right moves to get the job done. And it creates this perfect addictive experience. It's the kind of thing where if you lose, you want to get right back in there thinking, okay, I got this, I got so close, I can do this, I can do this. One more try, one more try. But those are just the standard missions. There's also extra missions that are meant to be salutes to the old days of arcade bonus stages. You can beat up a car, beat up a mail slug, carve up statues, or push a steamroller back that's being driven by Ryu Hakutoto. Well, how about that? Kasumi has been looking for her dad all this time, and he was right here all along. Hi, Ryu Haku! <laughs> Bye, Ryu Haku. Uh, nobody tell Kasumi about this. And you might find yourself thinking, is it really worth doing all these missions just to unlock new colors for your characters? Oh, 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 you have no idea. You see, when you start the game, every character has two costumes and four colors already unlocked for them. Colors A, B, C, and D. And that all by itself would be more than enough in most games. Heck, these starting costumes already felt wild enough all on their own. I mean, who wouldn't want to play a game as Hattori Hanzu if you could transform into Waspinator? But you can unlock more colors for every single one of these costumes, going all the way up to color H. And the E and F colors are just that, alternate colors. But they get really interesting with them. A lot of them are references to other SNK characters, or just to whatever Falcon felt like putting in here. I mean, why wouldn't you give Leona an Evangelion reference color? Actually, you know what, scrap that. Make it two Evangelion colors. But if that's what colors E and F were, what were colors G and H? G and H, for every single character's costume, and I remind you, every character already had two of them available at launch, are completely brand new secret costumes. And sure, some of them are just weird, many of them are really tacky, but a lot of them are callbacks to other characters. If you're an SNK nerd, you will be in heaven going through these costumes. You got Kyo and Fio dressing up as Yuki and I from Neo Geo Battle Coliseum. Ralph and Clark are Marco and Tarma from Metal Slug. Rock Howard and Iori are Kaede and Setsuna from Last Blade. You remember how in Street Fighter V they put out a ton of Resident Evil and Darkstalker costumes and charged you a ton of money for it? Imagine if all that was free and was already in the game at launch and they were just rewards for doing missions in the game. It's that level of deep dive and that level of rewarding. I love it and as I said, unlocking this stuff is crazy addictive. I wanted to show off Leona's Hydran costume and then I realized, oh, I haven't unlocked that one yet. So I went into this game and played enough missions to get it. And then I played two more hours because these missions really make you want to just keep unlocking stuff. Outside of the crypt in Mortal Kombat, this is some of the best single player content and best unlockables I have ever seen in a fighting game. But what about the story? Remember, this was part one of their big maximum impact saga. So, what did they have planned? After facing off with the new crime boss of Southtown, where could you take this story? SPACE! Yes, this story sees you traveling the world until you fight Jivatma, and while they keep it just vague enough, it is largely hinted that Jivatma is an alien who is on Earth looking for Judime, a super soldier from space who lost his memories, but might be closer than you'd expect. Yes, again, we never learn the full truth of it, but it's largely implied that Judime is either the breakdancing cowboy Sori, or it's both Sori and Alba. Basically, Judaim split apart, lost their memory, and Jivatma needs them to do the fusion dance to merge back together again. 
But the end, you beat Javatma, only for Alba to find himself back in Southtown with Luis, who tells him that his brother Sori has been kidnapped by Addis, the true secret evil organization behind not just Jivatma, but Duke as well. Well, holy crap! We are only on part one of this story, and it's already insanely overly complicated. Man, I wonder how nutty it's going to get in the next part. And I'm going to keep wondering that because that next part is never coming. Yes, as I said, Maximum Impact 2 happened because Maximum Impact 1 sold far better than SNK expected, going well over 100,000 copies in America. But Maximum Impact 2? Yeah, not so much. It only sold 80,000 copies. Well, I mean, okay, that's not great, but going from 100,000 copies to 80,000 copies isn't a huge drop. Except that 80,000 copies isn't the sales numbers in America... That's the global sales numbers. And while we don't know the global sales numbers on the first Maximum Impact game, it is estimated that it was around 400,000, meaning this sequel only sold a fifth of what the original did. And to make matters worse, it only sold an estimated 10,000 units in America. You remember that big push SNK was making to appeal to the US, and after the surprise success of Maximum Impact, they were putting all their hopes on this franchise to make that happen? Well, those plans are gone. But why? Why did Maximum Impact 2 only sell a tenth in America what its predecessor did? Well, as I said, the combat was pretty heavily criticized in that very first game, as was the English dub, so I'm sure that did turn off a lot of the people who bought that first game and didn't bring them back for the sequel. But probably the most damaging thing to its sales, at least here in the States, is that for some reason, in North America, Maximum Impact 2 was not called Maximum Impact 2. Instead, it was called, you ready for this? You ready for this? Grab a chair or else you might fall over because this is a big one. It was called King of Fighters 2006. Yes, in a franchise where all the mainline installments were named after the year they came out, they were tempted to name the first game King of Fires 2004, but they said, no, that's stupid, it will confuse customers. So for some reason, they decided to name the sequel to the game King of Fighters 2006. So now people looking for King of Fires Maximum Impact 2 just thought this was a different game and part of the mainline series, not the sequel to the game that they had previously bought. And to make matters worse, this was after King of Fighters 11 came out, meaning the mainline games had stopped naming themselves at this point after years and began naming themselves after their installment number. Then the sequel to a spin-off came out, and that spin-off was not named after the mainline series, but now the sequel to that spin-off was going to be named after the mainline series, but only after the mainline series had changed their name to something else. So no matter what game you were looking for, when you went into the store and picked this thing up, you just asked, what are you? So yeah, just like that, the future of the Maximum Impact line was pretty much scrapped. Well. Almost. SNK still thought there might be something to be gained from this series, so they were going to give it one more try. Maximum Impact Regulation A. The A stood for three things. Arcade, as the game now actually had an arcade release. Arrange, as now there were no longer solo fights in the game, but instead it was the classic KOF three-person team, so that means that you could arrange them before each match. And Ash Crimson, who was now officially joining the cast. This was a big deal because not only was Ash the hero of the current mainline KOF games, but also to get everyone excited for Maximum Impact 2, SNK made a short four-part OVA which actually featured Ash Crimson, despite the fact that Ash wasn't in the game. Also, not that it needs to be said, but in retrospect, paying for a four-part animated series to hype up a game that saw an 80% sales drop, probably not the best use of SNK's money. But outside of Ash, there were only three other new characters. Blue Mary was the only KOF veteran to join. Then there was the brand new character Xiao Lan, the half-sister of Duo Lan, and the daughter of Ron. Hey, remember Ron? Xiao Lan was another member of the Assassin's Guild, the Hizoku. But she was something of a reject in that group as everyone distrusted her because she was the daughter of not just Ron, but a woman from outside the Hizoku who Ron had had an affair with, and even Ron didn't want anything to do with her now. 
Now, I actually really dig Zhao Lan. She's probably my favorite of the Maximum Impact characters. She's got a really cool design to her, and she fights with three different stances, each of which come with a wide variety of moves, including keeping a whole arsenal of weapons up her sleeves. Then the final new character came from the game Fighter's History, Makoto Mizoguchi. Falcoon had a really hard time convincing SNK to put this character into the game, but since Mizoguchi was his favorite fighting game character from when he was younger, he wanted to make it happen. Mizoguchi is a good-natured goofball who ended up joining the mob, only to realize too late he had signed up to work with the bad guys, and now he keeps trying to escape from them. But in this game, he finally manages to get away, and he finds out from his father about the King of Fires tournament. Mizoguchi wants to join, but in order to do that, he has to defeat his father's star pupil in order to get his invitation. And who was his father's star pupil? Yep, it was Lucky Glober. Even in the SNK multiverse, these guys still can't catch a break. Now each character kept their secondary costumes from the last game, but their secret unlockable third and fourth costumes, yeah, they were out. But each of the four new characters did get crazy elaborate secondary costumes, and dear god, these are the worst costumes in the game. It's no contest. Well, okay. Zhao Lan's is actually okay, I do like her big sleeves that look like lilies, but that flower crown is consuming her entire head, and that underboob is out of control. Mizo Gucci is just wearing a fundoshi, Ash is in this hideous bat hoodie with giant boots, and Blue Mary... What? What am I looking at here? She's wearing a thong under jort chaps and a visor with giant pom-pom pigtails. This is not Blue Mary. This is Blue Mary when she was in college and she appeared on MTV Spring Break special in the 90s. And to this day, she lives in fear that Terry is going to end up finding that video. These outfits are a train wreck. Now, as for the single player content, it's slim pickings this time around. As I said, this game was made for the arcades, not home consoles, so they kept the content kind of light. You can do single player matches versus the computer, or you can play the arcade mode, and that's pretty much it. And arcade mode is actually a lot more like time attack mode, as you have a set amount of time to complete the entire ladder, which does make things pretty tense towards the end. I never failed to beat it, but I did get close a couple times and my heart was pounding. But it's just so weird to me that they didn't think to separate arcade and time attack into different modes. Doesn't that seem like a really easy way to create more content? Who does that? Who in a game already lacking content would merge time attack mode and arcade mode? I want you all to remember that I said that. Although I will give them some cred, each team you fight is just three random characters all stuck together, but the final team that you go up against is Team Boss with Jivatma, Duke, and Nightmare Geese. That's actually a pretty smart idea for the last fight, I'll give you that. Now as I said, the game was originally made for arcades. It was built with the intention of fighting other players. So, how does it play? Well, for a while now, I've heard people say that this game has the best combat in the Maximum Impact games, which... Okay? I mean, I'll be honest with you, whenever I heard people say that, I never really got excited to play this game, because saying you're the best combat in the Maximum Impact games is not exactly the highest bar to clear. That doesn't really answer the question of whether or not the combat is good or not, but... Well, I gotta be honest with you. Yeah, it's actually pretty good this time. What can I say? Third time's the charm. They finally figured it out. The combat still feels loose, but it no longer feels random. It now feels like everything combos together smoothly the way it was always supposed to. And it's not brain dead like Maximum Impact 2. It's free enough to be fun, and it lets you experiment with it, but it's also restrained enough that you do have to actually think about what you're doing. And the inputs feel perfect. Every button I want to hit comes out just right. Unfortunately, though, the game never left Japan, so if you're interested in playing it, it might be kind of hard for some of you to get your hands on it, but if you do get the opportunity, yeah, I'd say check it out. The game even looks really good now. Ryo Sakazaki no longer has a trapezoid for her face. This actually looks pretty darn good for the PS2. Except for Yori's hair, that still looks terrible. So moving away from the story and onto the arcade scene turned out to be just what the gameplay needed. They were finally able to sit down and focus on the combat, and they were able to make a game that, sure, is lacking in all the fun unlockables and modes, but it actually feels really good to play. And SNK, being SNK, already decided that this was going to be a huge success. Sure, Maximum Impact 2 saw an 80% sales drop, but this game was cheaper to make, and we were going to be getting money off the arcade as well, and we no longer were trying to sell this thing outside Japan so we didn't have to pay for translations or dubs or anything else. So with all that going for them, 
SNK decided to announce at the Tokyo Game Show in 2007 that they would be making a sequel, KOF Maximum Impact Regulation A2. Damn, that is a mouthful. Now, this was a very, very strange announcement. Why was it a strange announcement? Because they announced this sequel in 2007. Maximum Impact Regulation A, the first, was released in arcades and on home consoles in 2008. Yes, SNK being the kings of leaping without looking, decided that after their last Maximum Impact saw an 80% sales drop, they should once again go ahead and announce a sequel to their new game before it even came out. Marge, my friend, I haven't learned a thing. And apparently this thing was going to be huge. Falcon News later on Twitter mentioned that they plan to include Hotaru Futaba, Tizok, Joe Higashi, Sam Shea from Fighters History, because apparently Falcon just loves that series to death, and on Hell. I'm kind of glad this thing got cancelled, because if this is what they did to Blue Mary, I do not want to see what they had planned for On Hell. And yes, you did hear correct, Maximum Impact Regulation A2 was cancelled. But why was it cancelled? Well, sales-wise, Regulation A1 was only released in Japan, where it sold 40,000 copies, which isn't great. Maximum Impact 2 sold 50,000 copies, so it isn't much of a drop, but it was a drop nonetheless. However, we don't know the amount of money the arcade releases brought in, so maybe it all evened out, but there's really no way to tell. Either way, in the end, it's very clear that the Maximum Impact games, while being a big surprise hit for SNK at first, definitely came back around and did more harm than good in the end. But I do think that these games have some good in them. The combat in the third one is really enjoyable. The single player content in the second game is one of the best of any fighting game of this generation. And heck, I even think that some of these characters are pretty cool. I'd totally be down for seeing Alba or Zhao Lan return. But sadly, with how much these sales numbers tanked, I doubt it'll ever happen. However, even with the poor performance of the second game, I'm not sure if that alone is why the series didn't continue. Because you see, Maximum Impact wasn't the only game giving SNK trouble at this time, and their financial problems were starting to stack up all over again. Yes, folks, I know that was a long detour, but it was necessary to let you know where SNK was at during this time. How the big triumphant return of SNK was starting to fizzle. How the financial problems that they had suffered through in the past were beginning to rear their ugly heads again, because SNK just couldn't stop spending money. And that leads us to the big finale of the Ash Crimson Saga. It is time to return to the mainline games as we now discuss King of Fighters 13. A game that has been called one of the best King of Fighters games, in fact one of the best games of the decade, and it is hailed to this day as a shining example of great mechanics and gorgeous sprite work and wait, whoa, 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 wait, whoa, whoa, hold up, whoa. This... This isn't right. We did King of Fighters 11, then Maximum Impact, and now we're on King of Fighters 13. Am I... am I forgetting something? Something that everyone who talks about King of Fires forgets? It feels like... It feels like someone reached back through time and erased our memories of something, but what could it be? What came before King of Fighters 13? We talked about King of Fires 11, and now we're on 13, but if there was an 11 and a 13, then that must mean that there was an- OH NO! The King of Fighters 12. King of Fighters 12 was released in arcades in April of 2009 and on home consoles in July of the same year, and oh man, this is a weird one to talk about. Because to put it bluntly, King of Fighters 12 doesn't exist. 
because King of Fighters 12 is just the beta version of King of Fighters 13. Yes, production on King of Fighters 12 started shortly after King of Fighters 11, and they knew they won this game to be the first big title of theirs on the seventh generation of consoles, which meant it was time to finally give these sprites the overhaul they so desperately needed. Again, this was really impressive what SNK was doing on such old hardware, but you can only clean up an old sprite so much. Now they were going to scrap everything and build a brand new game from the ground up with brand new sprites for every single character. But here's the thing. The reason King of Fighters were able to keep coming out so frequently was because they reused assets. Dropping everything and starting fresh was going to take time, especially considering how they were making these sprites. They wanted them to look as good as possible, so they decided to create 3D models for these characters and then painstakingly drew over every single frame of their animation to create the sprites. And hey, everyone has already said, but it's worth pointing out, this game does look amazing. This was a huge undertaking, but it paid off. These new sprites were rocketing KOF's art style into the next generation. I mean, just look at the in-between frames on this one arm thrust from Ryo. Okay, that's a very small thing, but damn, it probably took them days to animate just that. Wait, did I say days? I'm sorry. I meant months. In an interview with Japanese gaming site Fighters Frontline, the game's producer, Masaki Kukino, said that every single character took 16 to 17 months to draw. I don't mean it took them 16 to 17 months to create all the characters. No, no, no. I mean to make one character, it would take them almost a year and a half. Well, luckily, they had a fully dedicated staff working on the game. I'm just kidding, they only had 10 designers because when swapping to a brand new console generation and a brand new art style, you really want to make sure that you're understaffed as well. Oh, and you know what? While we're at, let's also put everyone on a tight deadline that cannot be changed for any reason. Yes, this game was going to be released in 2009 to line up with King of Fire's 15th anniversary, whether it was ready or not. And it was beginning to look like that was going to be a big fat not, because in 2008, when the arcade version of the game was meant to have its original location test, they had to delay those tests for five months. Imagine if a modern day fighting game told everyone that they were going to have a weekend beta test. Then suddenly they announced, oh, sorry, uh, we're actually going to push that back. By almost half a year. On the list of things that let you know your game's development isn't going well, that falls right below our studio was built on an ancient burial ground. But the next year, they were able to do it. They were able to meet the deadline and the game was released. Kind of, because this was the most bare-bones King of Fighters to date. For starters, you're probably looking at these stages and thinking, wow, they look amazing, they're so colorful and exploring with life. And you're right, these stages are great. There are also only six of them, one of which is just the nighttime version of another stage. So, okay, that's not great. But it's not the most important thing. This was the conclusion to the Ash Crimson Saga after all. So, what was the story this time, and who were the teams? There was none, and there were none. Yes, because of the tight deadline, SNK had to put the game out in an as-is condition. So, whatever they had ready at the time was what went into the game. And while they made sure to get the important characters like Ash and Kyo and Yori done, they didn't exactly go down a list making sure that every single team got done all at the same time. Meaning they couldn't exactly release a storied installment of KOF where not all of the characters on each team were there. You couldn't go into the character select screen and then see Iori standing next to two question marks. So because of this, they said the game would be a dream match. Now if you remember, the previous two storylines fully played out over the course of three chapters, then they would have a fourth chapter that was a non-canonical dream match. These dream matches had no story, but they did bring back a bunch of the characters from previous games as a way to celebrate the series. Well, this dream match wouldn't be a celebration, more of an, oh crap, this is the only way any of this can make sense because none of this is ready on time. Because of this, the game only had 20 characters at launch in the arcades and 22 on home releases, meaning this game that was forced to be released so it could celebrate the first game coming out 15 years ago, now had a smaller roster than the first game 15 years ago. 
We had Ash Crimson, Duo Lawn, Shinwu, Kyo, Binimaru, Goro Diamond, Terry, Andy, Joe, Ryo Sagazaki, Robert Garcia, Leona, Ralph, Clark, Athena, Sai Kinzu, Shingen Sai, Ken Kapwan, and Iori, who now no longer used his flames. Why did Iori use his flames? Don't worry about it! Don't ask those questions! And there was only one new addition to the game, Raiden. I talked about him for a second in part one when he was a cut character from the first game, but he was a heel wrestler who used to work for Geese Howard, and while he did turn his life around and become a good guy going by Big Bear, clearly that didn't pan out and he was now back to his old dirty ways. Then when the game came to home consoles, they add Elizabeth and the returning Mature. Why was Mature here? Why was she back? And where's her partner Vice? Hey, what did I say about asking questions? It's a dream match, don't worry about it. Yeah, King of Fires was always known for huge rosters, with their dream matches being the biggest of them all, and now this dream match had a smaller roster than most of the other new fighting games on the market at the time. And what's worse is that this game that was, again, meant to celebrate the 15th anniversary of the series, was missing some of the biggest faces of the series. No bosses, no Kadash, no Yuri, no King, and of course... You may have noticed that a very important character from the Fatal Fury series was not included. Yes, my Shiranui. And fans were particularly upset about that last one as they took to the internet to start a campaign called No My, No Buy. Wow, with a campaign like that going into Shock Maximum Impact 2 didn't sell better. And the characters that were here had severely reduced movesets. Only a handful of characters had more than one super and most characters were missing moves from previous games. However, I will give the game this. Despite the reduced movesets, I still really dig this combat. It feels great to me. Finding out what combos together is fun. It feels good to experiment. There's a solid combat system in here. Or at least the start of one. Yeah, remember, this was not the game they wanted to make. It's the game that was available by the due date. So this is easily the simplest KOF since probably KOF 95 or 96. It's back to the original team setup, so no more of that tagging in and out stuff. You only had one bar for supers, and... Yeah, that's pretty much it. As I said, this game was massively simplified compared to other King of Fighters, and even though I suspect that was probably due to the crunch schedule, it might actually have been intentional, because before King of Fighters 12 came out, the game's producer, Masaki Kukino, said, quote, These days, I feel fighting games have become too complicated. So we decided to get back to basics. Ah, good plan. Because if there's one thing I know about fighting game fans, it's that they're always very accepting of a game simplifying themselves for new audiences, and they never complain incessantly for years on end about that to the point where it turns any online discussion of the game into a toxic nostalgia dump. Boy, that Guilty Gear retrospective is going to be a fun one to do. So yeah, the game was massively simplified. It really only featured two unique mechanics, a block that instantly counters, and another mechanic, that is actually one of my favorite mechanics in the entire franchise. Yeah, bet you didn't see that coming. Whenever I hear people talk about this game, they only talk about how it's an inferior version of KOF 13 and how it's an incomplete version of KOF 13, but I never hear anyone talk about the fact that this game actually does have its own unique mechanic that only appeared in here. As you fought, a bar would fill up, and once it was full, it would slowly start draining. But before time ran out, if you countered your opponent with a standing heavy attack, then it would perform a critical counter, and man do I love this. When you perform a critical counter, the camera zooms in, everything slows down, and then every single one of your moves link together, allowing you to build your own custom combo. I love mechanics that let you know that you did something awesome, and when you land that critical counter, everything just freezes and it becomes anime time after that. In fact, it's not just the critical counters that feel good. The sound design and all the little effects from when you hit each other actually do make this incredibly basic combat feel really special. One thing I really enjoy about this game is that when you and your opponent hit each other at the same time, you then have this little clash effect, and then it instantly resets both of your combos, and you have to think to yourself, okay, do I restart my combo, or do I try and block in case my opponent is going to try and get their attack in first? It's a little thing, but it does spice up this otherwise very simple gameplay. But where would you be using these mechanics? No point in having combat if you don't have modes to use them in, right? Well, this was the start of the 7th generation, and fighting games at this time were all about the online scene. 
This is when online matches were easier to set up and you had much smoother connections than the previous generations. If you were a fighting game coming out at this time, you had to make sure that you had good online. And KOF 12's online sucks. Well, okay, I will admit, I am not speaking personally on this one. Normally, I don't like to badmouth things that I myself have not experienced, but I can't experience this because either the servers are offline or nobody is playing this anymore. But every review that came out for this game lambasted it for having horrendous online with long load times and glitchy connections on their best day. So if you wanted to play this game, you were pretty much stuck with the offline content, which was next to nothing. The game came with an arcade mode, which was just time attack mode. Yes, once again, they decided to merge time attack mode and arcade mode, except this worked the exact opposite of how it worked in Regulation A. In that game, you had a limited amount of time to beat the whole arcade ladder. Well, in here, they keep track of how much time you take to beat each fight, then you're allowed to re-challenge each fight at least once for a better time, then at the end, they add up all your times, tell you what that total time was, and then they tell you to replay the game again to try and get a better time. Yeah, they turn arcade mode into a time attack mode because since there's no story, and no team endings, and no special edit team gallery, there is no reason to replay the arcade mode again other than daring you to beat your best time. And I will admit, that is a nice challenge, for about an hour, and then all the novelty is gone. And because of how this time attack is set up, this game has some of the worst AI in the franchise. Not because it's incredibly difficult, no, 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 the computer isn't hard, it's just annoying. The computer is constantly jumping and rolling around, it's like it hopped up on sugar. Even when I'm not doing anything, the AI is still freaking out. And eventually I realized, oh, it's bouncing around like a wild man, not because it's trying to beat me, but because it's trying to run down the clock and give me a worse score. Everything the computer does is designed to stall. The worst example of that is Athena, who just keeps spamming her reflex spell one on top of another. So the AI isn't trying to fight you, it's trying to be a dick and keep you from getting a trophy. They do try to spice the single player up by putting in these little cutscenes. You get this intro where they explain the time attack mode, you get this ending where they tell you your time, and there's one cutscene in the middle where they tell you that you're almost done, and for some reason, Jin Fu Ha from Art of Fighting 3 is there. Dude, why are you in this newsroom, and why aren't you wearing a shirt? But these scenes are bare bones. I'm not kidding. This is the ending that you get for being arcade mode in its entirety. This game, the last time trial has just finished. And now, the time has come to announce the final results. Holy cow, you couldn't even give me like a shot of my team staying on a stage doing their victory poses? Like, that was asking too much? Wow! And yes, as you can tell from that clip, this game didn't have enough time to create any extra modes or any special art for being it. But thank god they still had enough time for an English dub! Yeah, cause that's what everyone was asking for! Yes, this game did still have an English dub, but you could tell the money for dubbing was running dry. So many of these characters are being voiced by actors who, hey, God bless them for trying, but it's clear that they didn't speak English fluently. In fact, a couple of the characters like Terry and Athena are just being voiced by their original Japanese voice actors. And then there's a few voices in here that, I swear it was just done by a robot. I'm not even kidding. Welcome to the King of Fighters. Allow me to explain the rules of the tournament. Matches will be fought three on three. The tournament will be played as a time trial. Yeah, I've said it before, but this generation of KOF was when SNK wanted to make a big push for American audiences, and it's very clear they thought an English dub would help with that. I mean, heck, it certainly did for Street Fighter and Blaze Blue. And hey, I'm not opposed to the idea of an English dub for KOF, but it's crazy to me that they never had any luck with that. And yet still, when everything was breaking down and SNK was racing to get this thing out the door in any kind of a functional state, someone at the company still bothered to shout out, but the English dub! How will Americans play this if they don't have an English dub? So they still made sure to set time and money aside for that dub, but it was so clearly slapped together at the last second that instead of winning audiences over with it, it probably turned them away. 
And that brings me to the sales. When the game came out, it was met with some of the worst reviews of the entire franchise. The game got grilled for everything from the online to the roster to the content. Word of mouth was bad on this game. And that translated into the sales, as this game only sold a little over a quarter of a million units, which, okay, was a lot better than Maximum Impact 2 and even better than King of Fighters 11, but it was still a far cry from Maximum Impact 1, and considering how much more time this game took to get made, it needed to bring in much higher numbers. And speaking of Maximum Impact, I had some people on Twitter wondering why I was talking about both Maximum Impact and the Ash Saga in a single video. It's not like the stories or characters overlap in any way. True, they didn't. But the sales and development sure did. Now, I'll admit, no one at SNK has ever spoken about this, so this is all just speculation on my part, I can't stress that enough. But it did seem crazy to me that SNK knew how long these sprites were taking to get made. Maybe not when they started, but after a year of development, they definitely had an idea of how long this game would take to get made. Meaning, they should have known well ahead of time that they were not going to be able to reach that deadline for the 15th anniversary. So, the way I see it, I think one of two things happened. Either the team started working on this game, but then Maximum Impact 1 performed so well that SNK took resources away from this game and put it towards the six Maximum Impact sequels they wanted. Maybe they didn't directly take it away, they didn't walk into the office and start moving desk over to the Maximum Impact office. No, that didn't happen. But when it came time for the team working on KOF 12 to ask for the money and staff they needed, it wasn't available because SNK had already spent it on these surprise Maximum Impact sequels. Or the other option, maybe King of Fires 12 was never supposed to come out for the 15th anniversary in the first place. Remember, Maximum Impact was the game that they put out for the 10th anniversary, so maybe they plan on giving King of Fires 12 all the time it needed because, hey, don't worry about it. We got six Maximum Impact games planned out, and because we're using a ton of recycled elements for those games, we can just keep pumping them out left and right. You'll be fine. Take all the time you need. Only for Maximum Impact 2 to bomb, Regulation A to do just as bad, and now SNK was running into the KOF 12 office and screaming, Maximum Impact is cancelled! Get your act together because you're going on stage in five! I don't know which of these options it was, or heck, maybe it was some kind of a combination of the two. But when you look at the timetable, and you realize Maximum Impact was never supposed to get any sequels, then when it got a sequel, five more were supposed to come out right after that, then they were all cancelled, there is no way Maximum Impact didn't, forgive the pun, impact the development of KOF 12. And it sucks that they couldn't give this team more time because they only needed one more year. That's all. Because the very next year, SNK would release the completed version that they had always intended to make, and it would become one of the best King of Fighters ever. Fighters 13. 
King of Fighters 13 was released in July 2010 in arcades and the next year in November on home consoles. And this one, ooh man, this right here is a good one. I've heard many people call this the best King of Fighters tech. I've heard people say this is one of the best fighting games of the decade and after going back and returning to it for this video, yeah, they might be right. Mechanically speaking, it's still the original team format, but in terms of new gameplay mechanics, well, you had the super meter that now went up to three bars, but each time a teammate was KO'd, it would increase by one bar, meaning you could get up to a total of five bars. And you could, of course, use this meter for supers, but for the first time ever, KOF 13 now let you do EX specials. Basically, bigger versions of your normal specials that could have some added effect, like knocking your opponent higher for better combo options. But the most important feature was a second meter that built up as you fought called the Hyper Drive Gauge. And you could use this gauge for a few purposes. First up, you could use half the gauge to perform a drive cancel, where you could cancel one special move into another. But if you had three bars of your super meter and your Hyper Drive Gauge was filled, then you could perform your most devastating attack, the Neo Max Super Special Move, which might be the most anime sounding name I have ever read. These are massive super moves that can often fill up the entire screen, and they do feel good to use, but there's a way to make them amazing. You see, when your hyperdrive gauge is full, you can enter hyperdrive mode. And while in this mode, not only can you perform as many drive cancels as you want, meaning you can do some really crazy stuff, but also now your Neo Max supers only cost two bars instead of three, and you can cancel into them from your regular supers. And when you pull this off just right, it's one of the most satisfying feelings in the game. When you hit an opponent with a super, and then you just see everything freeze as you activate your Neo Max, Ooh, it just lets you know that you did something cool. And sure, it takes a lot of meter and just the right setup to pull something like this off, and as I said, I am pretty stingy when it comes to my cool moves budget, but even I think this is totally worth it. Comboing supers into Neomaxes can decimate your opponent's life. I mean, just look at this. I'm not even doing anything crazy, and it still takes off almost all their life. I have to say, I'm so happy that I got to go back to this game and really dedicate some time to it for this video, because as I said, people call this one of the best fighting games of the decade. And while I did appreciate a lot of things about when I played it before, it never really blew me away like it did everyone else. I mean, I would play this game and I would walk away from it saying, yeah, this is good. It's, you know, it's good. That's about all I really had to say about it. But after going back to it and pumping hours and hours into it and really sitting down and trying to learn all the mechanics and how everything works in this game, yeah, I finally get it. I see why it's so good. But also I see why I didn't really dig it so much before. It's because there's so much amazing stuff that you can do in this game, but the timing on everything is super tight. You want to link those two special moves together? You have to link them at just the right moment. You want to link your super into your Neomax? Well, there's a couple supers that give you plenty of time, but a lot of other ones give you that one shot to get it just right. And that's just the stuff that the game teaches you. There is so much more to discover that you can only realize by diving in and experimenting. Like seeing how much maneuverability some of your moves give you that allow you to really whip around the stage in ways that enhance upon the short hops and rolls of the previous games. However, once you understand the timing, once you know when to cancel from one move into another, once you see how your moves can best be used to react to other attacks, you see a whole new world of possibilities open up to you. Once you get the timing in this game, you realize, wait, so that means that I can do this thing. And that means that I can then do this other thing. And that means I can then link those two different things together. And you combine that with how good and crunchy the sound effects are on every single hit and the shaking motion the impacts have that make every move feel so cool. And it makes this one of the most rewarding KOFs to play, whether that be competitively as you try and read all the possible actions your opponents can make and thinking about what you can do to counter that, or just going up against the computer and having fun with all the variety the game provides you with. Just to give you an example of what I mean, I hit an opponent with a special that popped them into the air, then I instantly canceled into sending Kyo's fireball across the floor, then the enemy fell down and perfectly landed on that fireball, and I thought, that's it, I've peaked. I should just stop playing fine games now because I'm never going to do anything that cool again. And this level of complexity has brought a lot of players to this game. A few years ago, a decade after the game's release, it suddenly saw a massive spike in popularity online as every FGC streamer and YouTuber out there started pumping out videos daily going through the game's trials, which are devastatingly difficult. But hey, if you don't want to learn all the massive crazy combos that use multiple EX specials and supers and Neo Max cancels, just doing a simple drive cancel here or there isn't too hard, and the basic combos feel really good all on their own. 
My only real complaint is that with all the cool stuff you need the drive gauge for, I wish it filled up a little bit faster. But in arcade mode, the game actually gives you achievements that you can pull off in match, and if you do them, then it instantly fills your meter by half. So, hey, if you just want to play arcade mode, then there's no problem. And you heard right, no more time attack modes disguised as arcade mode. Classic arcade mode was back, and it was a big deal, as every single character now had unique opening match dialogue with every other character. And this was years before NetherRealm started putting stuff like that in their games. And I'll admit, I don't think they needed them for everyone. There's a few that obviously they didn't know what to write for. I mean, I love K-Dash, but every single K-Dash exchange is just the other character saying, boy, you sure are grumpy, and that's about it. But a lot of these exchanges actually are great. They give the characters so much personality. And speaking of personality, the arcade mode once again has endings for every single team, each of which are drawn by Isuke Ogura, who is actually my favorite KOF artist. I'll admit a huge part of that is probably nostalgia since he's the artist who worked on the endings to the first two KOF games that I ever played, but it's also because I think their art is the perfect balance between the Japanese anime style and the American comic book look that to me feels like where KOF style always existed. And their art is so colorful, it just has this overflowing feeling of fun to it. I love these endings. But their art isn't the only thing that looks good. The sprite work is still phenomenal, even better than the last game since they pulled the camera back so the pixels are a lot smoother. And you can even customize the colors of the characters. And I've seen people do some crazy stuff with these palettes. And the stages? These are hands down the best stages in the entire series. The animation and the energy in them is just as good as in 12, but they're larger and there's so many more of them. Heck, there are some stages that can only be accessed in versus mode, so even if you think that you're done with the game just going through arcade mode, there's so much more to find in here. And if you're a big SNK nerd, which if you're still watching at this point in time, you probably are, there are so many cameos and easter eggs in these backgrounds, the best we've seen since KOF 2002. There's a Nako Shijo at a big sumo wrestler festival. There's Vanessa, Seth, and Ramon playing cards, and Seth is sweating because he's got a bad hand. There's a Tori Hanzo trying to figure out how to get back to his own time after being stranded here by Maximum Impact. After a dozen hours, I was still finding new characters poking their heads out in the background. Heck, you even see Shingo in some of these backgrounds with his arm bandaged up after he was attacked by Iori in the last game. These easter eggs have lore to them. And speaking of lore, for the very first time, King of Fighters 13 actually had a story mode. Yes, you no longer need to check the KOF website or an audio drama CD or a manga that never got translated to know what was happening. Sure, the story mode wasn't animated, but it was fully illustrated, and honestly, that's all you need. You don't need an expensive cinematic story mode in your fighting game. Just enough illustrations to keep the plot going and keep the audiences entertained. And the story even has splitting paths, where you can choose individual teams to see what everyone was doing before they joined the tournament, giving you a reason to keep playing the game over and over. You can also decide to choose different paths to follow to see what the villains were up to, and depending on what team you choose, you can actually find special dialogue between them and the other teams that will fill in some important plot points. For example, SNK keeps referring to Kyoku Tsunagi as a high schooler, despite the fact that time does move in the KOF universe, meaning years have passed since the very first game, and Kyo had obviously grown up since then. Well, if you play through the story with Kyo's team and you go up against Athena's team, they actually have dialogue explaining this. He dropped out. Yeah, they actually finally addressed that Kyo is an adult now, but between saving the world and Orochi and being kidnapped by Ness, yeah, he never managed to graduate and he ended up dropping out. I know it's a small thing, but as someone who is over five hours into a KOF retrospective talking about these characters' backstories and how everything links together, that did make me stand up and go, oh my god, they finally addressed it! We finally have an answer now! And speaking of that story, yes, seven years after it began, the Ash Saga was finally coming to a close. So let's delve into that and begin by talking about the roster. Now, I'll start by saying this game has been criticized because people consider the roster to be too safe, and hey, as I said earlier, I love weird rosters, but I get why this one was so basic. Remember, this game was meant to celebrate King of Fire's 15th anniversary, and according to Shane Benhauser, the business director for Ignition Entertainment who poured KOF 12 to home consoles, this game was meant to follow the theme, the rebirth of KOF. Oh, that is going to be so ironic in a moment. But it is why the game's roster was so standard, they wanted to celebrate the big iconic faces of the series. 
First up, you got Kyo, Benimaru, and Goro Diamond forming Team Japan again. Then Fatal Fury is the classic Terry, Andy, and Joe, with Terry going back to his original design because it played into the whole Rebirth of KOF theme. Also going back to the classics was the Psycho Soldiers team, once again made up of Athena, Sai, and Chin. However, Athena and Sai saw a massive redesign. Or, more accurately, an... undesign, I guess? Yes, Athena and Sai were given new looks designed to resemble how they appeared in their very first game, Psycho Soldier, way back in 1987. Very odd time to be paying tribute to that after all these years, but again, it was part of the whole Rebirth of KOF theme. Then Team K Dash returned with K Dash, Maximum, and Kula. The Artifying team was the original Ryo, Robert, and Takuma. The Ikari Warriors was the standard Ralph, Clark, and Leona. And Team Women Fires returned with Yuri, King, and of course, Mai. Yes, she was back, and SNK won you to know that. They put a big collage of her in the gallery mode that you can unlock parts of whenever you get an in-game achievement. Heck, they even put her right smack dab on the disc. You can practically hear the SNK dev screaming, Here! Here! She's right here! We did exactly what you asked of us, so please buy this game, okay? So those teams were all pretty basic, but as for the more interesting lineups, Team Elizabeth returned with Elizabeth, obviously, Duo Lawn, and now the third spot was filled out by Shin Wu, who after Ash sicked an aging Irish assassin on him in the last game, had a few questions and punches ready for his old friend. Kim Kapwan once again had his own team, but after the last few games, people were beginning to doubt whether or not his whole reform program actually worked. So to prove it, he decided to get two new fighters to join him. The previously mentioned Raiden and Hua Jai, a Muay Thai champion who also used to work for Geese Howard even being one of the mid-bosses in the original Fatal Fury alongside Raiden. Also, speaking of Team Kim, I love the soundtrack in this game, and I know it's probably an unpopular opinion, but the Team Kim theme, Tame a Bad Boy, is one of my favorite tracks in the entire series. The rising intensity of the notes, the smooth drum and bass beat all lean into this keyboarder just going off, it's got this great adventurous feeling to it, and it's one of those songs that I just love to put on in the background no matter what I'm doing. Heck, I'm probably listening to it while I'm editing this video. And then there's the final team, Team Iori, made up of Iori, Mature, and Vice. Now, I know you might be thinking, wait, Mature and Vice? Aren't they dead? Didn't Iori kill them in KOF 96 when he was overcome with the Orochi Blood Riot? Yes, but there's a very good explanation for their return. They're Ghost. No, I'm not kidding, that's the actual explanation, they're Ghost. Yes, you see, Vice and Mature were part of the Hakeshu, the followers of Orochi. And when they died, their spirits joined Orochi. Well, those from the past had already weakened the Orochi seal in KOF 2003, and then 11, they stirred Orochi awake, but Orochi could sense that his powers were being absorbed by those from the past, and he didn't like that. So he released Mature and Vice's spirits, so that way they could go and team up with Iori to try and stop them. Now, why would Iori agree to this deal with the devil? Because after Ash stole the Magatama that gave Iori his flame powers, he was more than a little upset, even by Iori standards. Well, Iori's flame powers came from two sources, his family's Magatama, and Orochi. Yeah, remember way back in part one, I mentioned that his family, the Yasukani, originally fought against Orochi, but then the Hakeshu tricked the Yasukani into hating the Kusanagi clan, so that way the Yasukani would go and ally themselves with Orochi. Well, if Orochi was able to give his ancestors the power of the purple flame in the first place, then maybe teaming up with Vice and Mature could help him to get it back. That's also why Iori doesn't have his flame powers or many of his old moves in this game. Instead, he fights with powerful claw slashes, which was actually the fighting style of his Yasukani ancestors. It's a nice little detail in this game that I really enjoy. Now, that's all the teams in the game, so you're probably wondering, wait, where the heck is Ash? This is the conclusion to the Ash Crimson Saga. How is he not here? Oh, he is. He's just not on a team. Yes, Ash Crimson was in here as a single-entry character, the very first time a KOF hero was ever a single-entry within their own storyline. You could fight him in the arcade mode if you got a high enough score before the fifth fight, and he wasn't the only secret character you could go up against. You remember how I mentioned the arcade mode gave you little objectives to hit that would give you a boost to your drive gauge? Well, if you did at least two of them per match, then you could fight Billy Kane. But if you managed to do five per match, then you could go up against Psyche. In case you forgot, Psyche is the leader of those from the past. Yes, the boss of the villain team for the whole storyline was not the final boss of the game. At least, not in this form. 
As for how he fights, Psyche is almost an echo fighter for Ash. They use very similar moves to them, except that while Ash uses charge inputs, Psyche uses more basic Shoto style inputs. So he uses similar moves to Ash, and he even kind of looks like Ash. Hmm. I wonder if there's a story reason for that. Well, before we get into all that and see how this whole storyline wraps up, I think it's about time that we do something that we haven't covered in a while here. Before we end our video today, how about we take a quick look at what got cut? Yeah, as you can imagine with the long production time of KOF 12 and 13, as well as being forced to push it to a release date before it was ready, there was a lot that got cut from this game. And a lot that got changed. For starters, while they did put it into KOF 12, when it came to KOF 13, SNK finally gave up on the English dubs. You will not find any of that in here. Unless you can get your hands on the 1.0 mall of the arcade release. Because in the data for that game, you can find sound files for the English dubs for each of the characters, including all the new characters that weren't in KOF 12, meaning these aren't just the leftover recordings from the last game. No, they actually spent money on brand new dubs for every single character. And then they just decided not to use it. And I have to wonder why. Don't get me wrong, these dubs were not good. It probably was a smart idea for them to not put it in. But the files are all here in the system. They already spent money on this and put in the game. They just didn't turn them on. Did they just have a change of heart at the last second? They spent so much time and money on this. What was it at the very final second that caused them to decide not to put it in? I have no idea. And in the off chance that you really want to hear what these lines sounded like, don't worry, the modding community has your back as some tech wizards found a way to put them back into the game. Not exactly sure why you'd want to do that, but hey, it could be fun for a laugh. This is what Kyokugen is all about! Next up, Iori wasn't originally going to be teaming up with Mature and Vice. No, originally, he was going to be teaming up with the returning Oswald and a new character, a mysterious woman in a kimono. That's really all we know about her. There's no additional information on who this woman could have been, and as far as I can tell, there's no artwork either. But I would love to know what the original plan for her might have been. Then, if you look at early concept art for the game, you'll notice that Clark's design was very different. It was far more in line with what you'd expect of him. Clark never really struck me as the type of guy who would walk around shirtless. That's far more of a Ralph thing. Well, there's a reason for that. The devs were so pressed for time that in the end, it was easier for them to just put Clark's head on Ralph's body. Sure, they still had to draw sprites for every single one of Clark's unique animations, but for the few frames of animation that the characters did share, it saved them just enough time to make it worth it. If you look at that same early design page, you'll notice a whole team of unused characters. We know nothing about them, but this one fighter looks a lot like Rimello, a silent, creepy little girl who was a member of those from the past, implying that these characters were all going to be villains, which does make sense considering this is the first storyline where the villains didn't have their own team in the third game. And they weren't the only cut characters. If you check the art book for KOF 12, you'll see a lot of scrap new character ideas. As for cut returning characters though, Adelheid Bernstein was going to return again as a single entry character. Malin was going to be playable again, and before Hua Jai and Raiden joined, Chang was once again going to be on Kim's team. And perhaps most shockingly of all, Geese Howard was going to at one point be a secret mid-boss, and when you fight Billy Kane, you can even hear the rendition of soy sauce for Geese they had planned for him. I should also bring up that there are several other characters that were rumored to at one point have been planned for the game because sprites were made for them for the KOF 13 trading cards, including Shingo, Whip, Hydern, Ignis, and Orochi himself, but the more I look into it, the more I think they were just made for the trading cards. I haven't found any confirmation from anyone at SNK that they were actually going to be in the game itself. But okay, that's everything worth mentioning. Let's finally see how the Ash Crimson Saga wrapped up. Those from the past had begun to awaken Orochi in the last game and had started sucking up his godly snake powers, but they needed more fight energy to finish the job to open up their gate to go back in time, which is maybe the weirdest sentence I've ever said. So they used Botan's powers to once again mind control Rose Bernstein into hosting another King of Fires tournament. But since the last game, Ash has now wormed his way into those from the past good graces. I mean, he's already stolen two out of the three sacred treasures, that looks good on anyone's resume. However, it quickly becomes clear that he is not on their side. Ash Crimson is on Ash Crimson's side. He starts manipulating everyone around him, telling Adelheid, 
Hey, you know, your sister's kind of acting weird. Maybe Hyder knows something about that, and... You know, don't you know the Akari Warriors? Yeah, they beat you up that time, so you've got his number just laying around. Maybe you should call him up. Then he tells one of the members from those from the past named Shroom, Hey, you know that room Psyche keeps telling you not to go in there? How about you go in there? All the cool kids are going in there. So Hydern sends his team of secret agents to investigate the tournament, and lo and behold, they find a secret chamber where Psyche has been using a device to suck up Orochi's power. Then Shroom researches the time gate that Psyche plans on using to go back into the past, only to realize, wait a second, this thing requires us to be sacrificed! I didn't sign up for that! This leads us to the big finale, as your team is crowned the champions, only for time to stop as Psyche and his followers appear. Behind them, the giant time gate appears, and Psyche transforms into his true form in order to get rid of you once and for all before returning to the past to take over the world. And this fight is... Well, it's not super hard, but it is annoying. Psyche tends to stand there and wait for you to come to him, and when you do, he encases you in goo and grabs you, at which point he performs one of the most dehumanizing moves in KOF history. <laughs> Yeah, get ready to see that a lot. Over and over again. I can get but if you're having problems with this fight, let me give you a tip. Use Maxima. I'm not just saying that because he's one of my favorite characters, it's because Maxima has a charging command grab, and for some reason, Psyche cannot react to this move. You can just spam this and you'll perfect him. Yeah, how's that feel? How do you like being grabbed and hit with the same move over and over again, Psyche? Bet it feels pretty bad, huh? But after you beat Psyche, he shrinks back down to normal and says, You know what? It doesn't matter. Because as soon as I go through that gate, I'm just going to absorb the powers of Orochi and go back in time and wipe out all you humans in the past and hey, wait, why is that door closing? He looks up and sees that some of the stones that powered the gate are gone. Psyche curses Ash for this, but I'm pretty sure it was actually Shroom who took the stones. Last time we saw him, he was researching how the gate worked and he wasn't happy about it. Psyche makes his way to the gate, trying to get to it before it closes, only for Ash Crimson to step in and finally reveal his true plans. You see, the whole reason he had been acting like a villain and stealing the sacred treasures was so that he could convince Psyche to let him join his team and then betray him. Ash reveals to Elizabeth that he never forgot the Blantorch family mission and all of this was part of his plan to take down those from the past. He uses his powers to steal Psyche's soul, at which point he tells Psyche that they're all going to get sent back to the past where they'll live out their lives the way that they were supposed to. Now, okay, I said this story gets confusing and this is what I was talking about. Because there's a lot that isn't actually said in the game and a lot that isn't actually said anywhere and we just kind of have to take our best guess at it. First thing we have to point out is that the reason why Ash looks so much like Psyche is because Ash Crimson is Psyche's descendant. And some of you might be wondering, wait, Ash says he's going to send the villains back to the past where they'll be defeated just as they were supposed to be. But he just sucked out Psyche's soul, isn't he already dead? It's not clearly explained, but I get the sense that because those from the past were never supposed to travel to the future in the first place, and the timeline is some kind of a living being that wants to repair itself, I get the feeling that as long as Ash just sends them back through the door without Orochi's power, then the timeline will naturally reset itself. Again, that's not said anywhere, but it's the only way something coming up can make any sense. Have I mentioned yet how glad I am that the KOF games decide to tackle time travel? My brain is melting. How? Can events happen before the ones that happened before? And lastly, if you're like me, you're probably wondering what the heck Ash Crimson's powers are. He's got the green flames, and he can also steal sacred treasures out of people's bodies, and now he can apparently steal souls as well? 
Yeah, this one was never explained anywhere, but I do want to thank a Twitter follower who sent me a link to a tweet from Akihiko Orishino, the man who did many of the light novels for SNK, in other words, the guy who actually explained a lot of the lore for many of these games. He says that the way he was told it is that Ash was born with only one power, the ability to steal other people's powers, kind of like Rogue from the X-Men. But Ash was an orphan who was adopted by the Crimson family, and the Crimson family was born with the ability to produce green flame. But the Crimson family mysteriously died, and it was then that the Bland Torch family adopted Ash since they were French with the Crimsons. Now, even though it was never said anywhere, this leads me to believe that maybe Psyche's followers, or maybe even Ash's real parents who were loyal to Psyche, knew Ash had these powers, so they left him to be adopted by the Crimsons knowing that this would get him close enough to their sworn enemies, the Bland Torch family. But then, when he was a small child, Ash's powers activated, and he stole the Crimson family's flame powers. And without the knowledge of how to control it just yet, this accidentally resulted in the Crimson family's death, leading to Ash now being raised by Psyche's sworn enemies, the Bland Torch family. And at this point, you're probably thinking, wait, but the Bland Torch estate burned down and Elizabeth's whole family was killed. You mean to tell me that Ash killed his adopted family just to get close to Psyche? That sounds pretty bad. That doesn't sound like the secret plan of a hero. That definitely sounds like the act of a villain. Well, here's the thing. We always assume that Ash was the one who burned down the estate and killed his adopted family because all we knew was that their home burned down. So of course, the guy with fire powers seems like the obvious culprit but we never knew what color the flames were that burned their home down. If they were green, then yeah, it was probably ash, but we don't know. However, based on what we do know, I would say that more than likely those from the past had arrived here in the present, and then they were the ones who tried to kill the Bland Torch family by burning their home down to make sure they couldn't interfere in their plan. Then when Ash realized Psyche had returned, he decided to leave Elizabeth so he could carry out his family's mission to defeat Psyche himself. I realize I am making a ton of assumptions here, but listen, I love King of Fighters and I love that they plan out these big elaborate stories, but sometimes these stories don't go from A to B to C. Sometimes they go from A to G and they just tell you, uh, yeah, there's a couple of other letters in there, don't worry about it. So, Ash had sucked out Psyche's soul. The door to the past was closing. All he had to do was shove all the villains back inside and then the day is saved, right? Well, except for one problem. Psyche's soul is too strong for Ash to absorb into himself, and it ends up overtaking him. So now, Psyche is in control of Ash's body, and thus is born the true final boss of the game, Dark Ash. Meaning I can now finally play this Army of Darkness clip that's been stuck in my head for the last two hours. I'm bad, Ash. And you're good, Ash. You're goody little two-shoes. You're goody little two-shoes. Little two-shoes. Little goody 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 two-shoes. Sorry, I had to get that out of my system. Now, Dark Ash is essentially, what if Ash didn't have to charge his attacks, and he could just spam one special move after another? If he starts zoning you out, he will never stop zoning you out. But he does have one big weakness. His legs. Yeah, he doesn't know how to guard his feet, so as long as you keep attacking low, you're pretty good. And like with most zoners, the moment that you get in there, apply some pressure and he'll go down. After being defeated, Ash is able to regain control of his body and he stands there watching as the giant gate closes. Psyche begs Ash to go through the gate, saying that if he walks through, then the two of them can survive and they can still take over the world. But Ash just stands there, letting the gate finally close and vanish away. Ash then turns to Elizabeth and tells her that he's sorry, and that because he didn't send Psyche back through the gate, that means that he could never eventually have a kid, which means Ash himself was never born. This is another reason I'm pretty sure that if Ash just sent Psyche's body through the gate, then it would have caused everything to still live out the way it was supposed to. Otherwise, it would have caused a time paradox, which is exactly what was happening now. Because Ash didn't go back through the gate, Psyche couldn't return to the past, meaning Ash could never have been born. And so, Ash apologizes to Elizabeth for everything that he had done before he fades away. This causes everyone around the world to forget about Ash and what he did, except for Elizabeth and her team. They win the KOF tournament this year, but they can't help but feel like something is wrong. 
they can't help but feel like something from their lives is missing. As Elizabeth rides away and sheds a single tear over her lost friend who never existed. And that's it. That's how the Ash Saga wraps up. As I said, this was certainly a divisive chapter for KOF. And not just because trying to figure out all the time travel stuff at the end caused my head to catch on fire. This broke me. Uh, the dot over the eye. That broke me. I'm... I'm done. No, because over the course of preparing for this video, I have had many people contact me who love Ash Crimson. And many people who hate Ash Crimson. It was pretty much right down the middle on this one. But what do I think about Ash? Honestly, I'm fine with Ash. I mean, I'll admit he is my least favorite of the KOF heroes, but I still think he's alright. However, looking back at this entire story, looking at the complaints that people have about Ash, I think he would have gone over far better if he hadn't been the hero and instead he had been the rival of the story. I know the entire premise of Ash was what if our next hero was a villain, and I do think that's a cool idea, but I don't think that idea worked the way they planned this all out. You see, I already laid out a few of the problems that people had with Ash, but now the story is over, I realize there's a few other issues that were probably a bigger deal for the fans. For starters, it's a small thing, but I understand people having a problem with Ash being introduced by taking out the Sacred Treasure members. I mean, when you introduce your new hero by having him beat up the previous stars of the game, it does kind of come off like the company is saying, look at how cool our new character is. Boy, he sure is better than those old characters. And yeah, that is the sort of thing that leaves a sour taste in fans' mouths. But more importantly, the biggest complaint that people have with Ash is that in the Orochi Saga and the Nest Saga, sure, you had our main hero, but many other characters felt like they mattered, like they had their own stories. But when it comes to the Ash Crimson Saga, yeah, Ash is pretty much the beginning and the end. In the Orochi Saga, Kyo was the hero, but Iori and Chizuru were connected to Orochi, Hydron and Leona had important stories, Mature and Vice were important, heck, even Yamazaki was revealed to be connected to the overall plot. In the Nest Saga, Kadash is our protagonist, but you can't tell the story of the Nest Saga without Maxima, without Whip, without Vanessa, or Ramon, or Seth, or Benny Mara, or Kyo. But in the Ash Crimson Saga, listen, I like Duo Lon, I like Shin Wu, they're good characters, they're fun to play as, I dig their designs, I dig their personalities. But end of the day, did they actually matter to this story? They didn't have any connections to those from the past. Any individual stories they had didn't really matter. I mean, both Duo Lon and Lin in the Nest Saga were looking for Ron. Difference is, Lin actually found him because Ron was tied to the plot. Duo Lon just drops that whole storyline after the first game because nobody remembered Ron. And I know someone is going to say, no, they do matter to the plot because Duo and Shin are both Ash's friends and they're concerned about him. Exactly. Duo and Shin only really exist in here because they're Ash's friends. They only matter because they're connected to Ash. You could have created any character with any motivation, with any backstory, as long as they were connected to Ash, that's all that would matter. And I hate saying it, but the same thing goes for Elizabeth. I know someone is going to say, no, she matters because it was her family destiny to defeat Psyche. Yes, it was. Did she? No. That was Ash Crimson. Sure, she defeated Magaki in the second game, and K-Dash defeated Mukai in the first game, but end of the day, did it matter who beat them? Did that ever actually come up or play into the plot in any way? It could have been anyone. It doesn't even play into any character's individual endings. In the end, Elizabeth's important to the storyline is that she's there so someone can talk about Ash. Same thing goes for the sacred treasures. They're important to the plot, so they can bring focus to Ash because this whole story is just focused on Ash. Whenever Ash Crimson isn't on stage, someone should be asking, where's Ash Crimson? He was so big, he completely outshined the actual villains of the game. Those from the past are probably the most forgettable villains in the entire series because Ash is the entire focus. Heck, just think about the fact that this was the first storyline not named after the villain group. It was named after Ash because he was the only character that really mattered. And part of that does come down to the fact that Ash is our hero and he's also kind of the villain, so he's sort of taking up both roles in this storyline. And because of that, yeah, I think a lot of the problems with Ash would have been resolved if he had been the rival and Elizabeth had been the hero. Imagine this. 
Imagine Elizabeth pops up in KOF 2003 instead of Ash, and she enters the tournament because her friend disappeared and she's trying to find him. She talks about him in her backstory and in the arcade ladder, but then she runs into Mukai and that's when we learn about her family's connection to those from the past. Then you play through the Sacred Treasures arcade mode and that's when you get your first glimpse of Ash, and you as the player go, wait, that's the guy Elizabeth was looking for, but that was her friend, and he's evil. Wait, her friend turned into a bad guy? Oh man, that's a big deal. Then, as the story goes on, we wouldn't have all the attention focused on Ash. It would be more evenly split between Ash and Elizabeth. And it would provide more focus on those from the past since Elizabeth is our hero and it's her destiny to wipe them out. And since Ash wouldn't be our hero but instead the rival of the story, when he pops up and takes out the characters from the previous games, it would feel less like SNK was saying, look at how cool this new guy is, you have to like them now, and more like they were trying to hype up what a big threat he would be to the overall story. And if our hero was Elizabeth, we could get a more emotional connection to the story because the hero trying to save their old friend from going down a dark path only to learn that they were good all along is a much more emotional story than this French guy is doing something mysterious but we won't say what. And heck, it would make for a much better twist in the last game because in KOF 13 when Ash turned out to be good, it wasn't really that big of a surprise because, well yeah, he's the hero of the saga. We kind of figured he wasn't all bad, but if he was the rival, it would be a genuine surprise. But again, that's just me. I know that everyone has their own opinions on this storyline. As I said, it was pretty divisive. But what became of KOF 13, you may ask? Yes, remember the Maximum Impact series tanked hard after the first game, and KOF 12 did not sell what SNK needed it to. So there was a lot riding on KOF 13 and SNK did support this game. Heck, it even became their first game to have DLC characters add with Nest Eric Kyo, Classic Iori with his flame powers, and Mr. Karate, the masked alternate persona of Takuma. And like many DLC characters, they were insanely overpowered and completely wrecked the whole meta, but let's go back to those sales numbers. When King of Fires 13 was released, it actually saw far better sales than KOF 12, selling almost three times what KOF 12 did in its first two months. And it would go on to sell roughly 600,000 copies, and shockingly enough, a little over half of those sales came from the Xbox 360, so... Hey, I guess that big western push finally bore some fruit in the end. However, while definitely an improvement, it was still far from what SNK wanted, or more accurately, what they needed. King of Fires 12 and 13 took so many years and cost so much money, they needed this thing to sell and 600k was still underperforming, especially compared to every other major fighting game franchise being released at the time. This was during the 7th gen fighting game boom and this was still selling worse than not just Street Fighter or Tekken, it was selling worse than brand new franchises like Blazeblue. But why? This game was being applauded left and right, and it fixed the problems people had with 12. Heck, they even brought Mai back! And you said you would buy if there was Mai, so why didn't you buy? Well, sadly, there is an answer to that. It's that you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. As I said, SNK was really trying to push King of Fighters to sell in America during this time, because that's where the money was. However, America didn't really know KOF. It's the one spot on the planet where the franchise just never took off. Well, thanks to that fighting game boom I just mentioned, this was the best chance SNK was ever going to have to win this audience over. This is when everyone was picking up fighting games left and right. And that's when SNK released King of Fighters 12, a bare bones game with almost no roster, no single player content, and a trash online scene. So at a time when everyone was paying attention to fighting games, every single critic on the planet was telling people to stay away from KOF. So when King of Fires 13 came out in 2011, not only had a lot of that fighting game hype begun to die down and everyone wasn't just crazy to pick up the latest fighting game no matter what it was, but also everyone thought, oh yeah, this is that thing that I heard was bad, right? I'm not going to check that out, but what about the rest of the world, where KOF had always sold well? I mean, if it was able to survive outside of America before this, then surely it doesn't need those sales numbers now. Well, remember this was the very first KOF to get put on brand new consoles, and it didn't look good while all the other games out there were providing much better options at the time. So yeah, even in countries where KOF used to sell incredibly well, 
they couldn't really rely on that anymore for KOF 13. If SNK had just waited and let the team finish the game the way they wanted, then maybe things would have gone differently. Or maybe that was never a possibility. This game was already costing a ton of money and they spent years making it. Maybe giving the devs that extra year was never an option. So yeah, the era of SNK Playmore, which started with so much promise, was now turning sour. Maximum Impact and KOF 12 and 13 were back-to-back one-two punches of disappointment. This was strikes one and two for the company. Well, actually, that's not true. They were more like strikes six and seven. Yeah, these weren't the only big projects SNK had made over the past few years that did not pan out for them. Yes, after going bankrupt from dumping too much cash into too many failed projects, SNK was doing it all over again because burning money was in SNK's blood. In fact, they spent so much time and money on KOF 12 and 13 that rumors were spreading that SNK was going to go bankrupt again. Although, those were just rumors. As far as I can tell, there was never any actual threat of that happening. So, hey, as long as SNK wasn't going to go out of business again, that means there was still hope to turn all this around, right? Sure. If they wanted to. And SNK didn't want to. I said Maximum Impact and KOF 12 were Strike 6 and 7. Well, Strike 1 came years before this. You remember way, way back at the start of this episode when I said that Ben Herman, president of SNK USA, said that SNK had plans to develop games for the PS2 and the Xbox and next generation consoles? Well, what I didn't tell you is the reason why he had to come out and make that statement. Because right before this, SNK Playmore's president, Koichi Toyama, said that the company would be moving in a different direction, investing in the exciting new field of... Yes, Koichi Toyama said in January of 2004 that SNK would be, quote, moving its core business focus from games to pachinko slot machines. We will concentrate our resources on the rapidly growing and highly profitable business of slots. Yes, you heard correct. After SNK had been bought up by a company that just wanted to use them for pachinko machines and drove the company into bankruptcy for it, forcing the devs to all form their own new companies so that they could buy back each of their old titles one by one, the new president of SNK wanted them to focus on pachinko machines. Mm. First time. That's why Herman had to come out and reassure everyone, no, it's cool, it's fine, we're still going to be making regular video games. And hey, for many years they did. But then they had one failure after another, and suddenly the games weren't being profitable anymore, while the patchy slot scene kept bringing in money for almost no effort. But hey, there was still hope. Koichi Toyama ended up stepping down as president of SNK in 2009, and he was then replaced by Ryo Mizufune. He could end up turning everything around. Oh wait, he actually wants them to focus even harder on Pachinko. Okay, never mind, we're screwed no matter what. Many developers at SNK didn't feel right about this. They felt like the company was just tearing itself apart again. And it even led to the producer of King of Fires 13, Masaki Kukino, leaving the company just a few months before the game was released. Wow, the head of SNK wants to focus on pachinko machines and now the leading devs are leaving the company in disgust. I am having the worst case of deja vu right now. This would once again lead to SNK having to come out and address this, as one week after Masaki Kukino left the company, an SNK representative released this simple statement. In response to internet rumors from earlier this week, SNK is planning to release a full slate of games in 2011 and expects to continue publishing games worldwide for many years to come. Oh, whoo, okay, good. Nothing to worry about here, folks. We got a rich lineup of games coming in 2011. That's good to know. Let's, let's go ahead and see what they did release that year. Um, a mobile game. A uh, collection of old games, a uh, pachinko game, and two other mobile games. 
Um, hmm. Oh, uh, right. That was the year King of Fires 13 ended up releasing on home consoles. I mean, it actually released the year before this in arcades, so that's more of just a port that already came out, not really a not really a new game. In fact, it kind of feels like you're missing new games in this rich, full slate of yours. Oh, no. Yes, as in case higher-ups decide to embrace the very beast that had devoured them just a few years before, and they decide that now they want to break into pachinko machines, and with every passing year, and with one underperforming home console or arcade release after another, their lust for gambling machines grew stronger and stronger, all leading up to King of Fires 13 being the last new console game they would create for the foreseeable future. For the next several years, SNK only released three types of games, repackaged collections of older titles, pachinko machines, and super predatory mobile games. Or to put those three into simpler terms, ENDLESS TRASH! Yes, SNK had now given up on making games, and instead just wanted to focus on quick bucks through whatever greedy method they could use. They were Konami before Konami. And what makes this truly heartbreaking was that they did it to themselves. This wasn't like with Aruzi, where another company came in and bought them up. No, this time the call was coming from inside the house. And that means that there was no way out of this. When another company owns you and screws you over, someone else can buy you up and change course. Not really the case when you're the ones in charge and you're the ones making the bad decisions. But, but there's still hope. I mean, okay, SNK doesn't want to make games anymore, but maybe they could license the games out or hire another studio to make the new games for them. Nope. SNK would still have to spend money in order to hire a new studio to come in here and make their games for them, and after their last few flops, they didn't want to spend any more money on anything. Best to spend practically nothing on pachinko and mobile games, and then just sit back and watch the addiction cash flow in. Oh, well, uh, okay, so SNK just wanted money. Well, maybe someone else could buy the titles from them, and then they could take these titles from SNK and then they could make their own King of Fighters. Nope, SNK didn't want to make new games, but they didn't want to sell their franchises either, because then they couldn't turn them into pachinko machines. They were going to keep these legendary characters trapped in limbo forever, so that way they could be patchy slots and mobile games for the rest of time. Why are we still here? Just to suffer. Yes, after all this time, after fighting and struggling so hard to rebuild itself back from the brink of death, SNK was their own worst enemy. They were both hero and villain. That was it. The story was over. King of Fighters had created so many beloved characters, it had revolutionized storytelling and fighting games, it had built up a library that other companies couldn't dream of matching and had practically become a religion in some parts of the world, but now, none of that mattered, because SNK had decided to close down its gaming wing for good, and nothing was going to change that. The story of one of the biggest fighting games on the planet had come to an end. Not with a bang, but simply by fading away. Left by their own creators to be forgotten. Folks, thank you very much for tuning in to part 3 of our King of Fighters retrospective. I have no idea how these videos keep getting longer with each episode, but I'm really hoping that you guys enjoyed this, and thank you all for sticking around until the end. We only have one part left, and after that cliffhanger ending, you'll want to come back to learn how the heck SNK managed to come back once again. Plus, next time we'll be covering not only the latest 2KOF games, 
but also all the spin-offs as well. And trust me, there are some weird ones in there you don't want to miss out on. And if you still haven't hit that subscribe button and rung that bell and followed me on Twitter at Thorgy's Arcade, then make sure that you do that in order to know when the next episode goes up. And if you like these videos, then feel free to share them around the web. It really has been helping our channel grow, and I really appreciate it so much. Thanks again for tuning in, everyone. Stay safe out there, and come back next time.